Without further ado, I, in the first instance, I will pass the rako to Dean to open with a karakia. Kia koe, Dean. Thank you. Just a, just a brief word to the um, to the committee before I start. We uh, we are struggling. Um, we had been struggling with a with a for a quorum uh, due to the passing of Sir Toby. Uh, we will uh, be running to a very tight time time frame for our meeting because um, we will be short of a quorum at 12, 12 o'clock today. So we're going to move the meeting uh, very succinctly and we're not going to take a break. Sorry, um, everybody. We're going to run to what you're looking at and um, head for our uh, 12 noon um, uh, deadline. So uh, let's uh, be with me. Let us get through our agenda today. Uh, so without further ado, I'll continue with the agenda. Uh, to start us off, can I please call for apologies? I currently have Jeff Rice, uh, Councillor White and Cardinal Bird. Are there any others to be added? Um, Shade Rolleston. Shade Rolleston, thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, I have to leave at 10.30 to um, be a hearing. Okay, this is Councillor Nees. We'll okay. leave at 10.30. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, and Nikki Douglas. Nikki Douglas. Manu Pene. Rawiri Kingi. Vicky Thomas. Vicky Thomas. And Councillor Tanya Tapsall. Councillor Tanya Tapsall. Any others? Thank you. Can I have a mover, please? Second. Dean, thank you. Bill Walsley, seconder. All those in favour say aye. aye. Carried. Thank you. Public for forum, there is none. Items not on the agenda. Notification received uh, from the committee Nui or Ngati Fakoe, renew alternate representative, will be covered off in the chairman's report in 9.5, uh, 9.1, sorry. Order of business, business, there is no change to the order of business. Decora uh, declarations of conflicts of entries, do I have any? There are none, thank you. Um, to our previous minutes, um, I'm gonna take these taken as read. Do I have a mover and seconder, please? Thank you, um, Dean. Thank you, Grant, seconder. All those in favour, say aye. Any matters arising from those minutes? We have none. Carried. Thank you. We're going to move straight into our presentations. Our uh, first presenters are here. Welcome to um, Brad, firstly, and then we'll move straight to Richard. Uh, firstly, around the Titumu development update with Brad, and then the YRD treatment plant update with Richard, so we'll move straight to you, Brad. Welcome.
Tina Koto Katoa, uh, Ko Brad Bellamy Toku Ingoa, He Kamahi Aho, Otea Kuni Hura, O Toronga, Norera, Tina Koto, Tina Koto, Tina Koto Katoa. Oh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation to come along and speak. Um, let me just get this presentation. I, uh, um, the first thing I wanted to say was that it's been, by the looks of it, three, three years since an update on Tatimu was provided to Tamaru. So I um, wanted to firstly acknowledge that. Um, there is, I guess, quite a bit to update to update you on but there's also been very slow progress with the project so um what i'll try and do today is, is go through um topics as quickly as i can but um hopefully not skip too much so. the other key point i uh, while i move through them the topics which are up on the screen now um were that uh, I've come into the project, um, uh, now leading the project after the departure of Cam Larking earlier in the year. So obviously Cam had um, quite an in-depth and long history with the structure planning for Tatamu. Um, so some of the topics that I'll cover today, <clears throat> I haven't personally been um, directly part of or, or I guess experienced. So uh, what I'll do is focus on how um, I hope to see the project move forward um, as well. So firstly, I wanted to touch on just uh, um, a refresh on some of the key elements that have gone into Tatumu and the structure planning project itself. Um, some of the key elements I've got up there on the screen, um, firstly, understanding the extent of the constrained land, and that's something that's continually needing to be refreshed and updated as we see new guidance um, come through on the likes of sea level rise. Um, in the last couple of weeks, even new projections have been released. So there's still work to be done in that, in that space now, uh, as well as uh, national direction, whether it's freshwater uh, or the recent uh, introduction of the draft exposure plan for indigenous biodiversity. So there's still um, work to be done in, in, the, in and around the constrained land, land element. Um, land use patterns um, is a key element, um, finding the right mix of housing type densities and typologies by also providing um, the opportunity for community facilities and employment opportunities. Uh, along with um, climate change, uh, there's also the need to look at resilient infrastructure and stormwater management and linking that in with comprehensive stormwater consents that already exist in those areas. Strong focus now on transit-oriented corridors. So we have um, a lot of work to be done and it's being done in and around providing uh, a range of modal options through Tatamu, um, as well as how we make use or best use of a range of open space opportunities that the Timu will bring. Um, another um, critical space that we have done some work on, but is still to be done is in around the ecology, cultural and heritage values work, and also um, bringing it all together through the management of natural risks as well, which still remains an important element. So where have we got to at the moment? Um, we still sit in a space where approximately 400 of the 740 hectares of the Tatamu growth area we acknowledge could be developed. The remaining land um, would remain undeveloped um, to serve a number of purposes, including preservation of natural features, cultural history, uh, whilst also providing resilience around uh, natural hazards and the effects of climate change. A key element still remains around delivering on the aspirations of existing landowners, and there's a lot of work done at the early parts of this project to understand what those were, and we appreciate those aspirations may continue to change, and it's being able to respond to that through this project. I've just zoomed in on the structure plan a little bit, um, but... I haven't got many slides, so we can easily come back to <laughs> questions on this as we go through. So just touching quickly on the project work streams themselves, as I um, alluded to, natural hazard assessments um, 
a lot have been done and some need to be refreshed. Um, if I was reflecting on liquefaction, for example, which the report was done in 2018, uh, a lot of things have changed since, since then, including um, building code changes, um, as well as work that Tauranga City itself's done across a citywide project for liquefaction. Um, a lot of learnings from those types of projects that need to come back into the Tatamu space now, and those will require um, those reports to be updated. Ecological assessments. Uh, again, that comes back to a lot of work that has been done, but now with national policy statements um, around the corner on Indigenous biodiversity, etc., there needs to be a, a refresh and a relook at some of those things as well. Um, cultural heritage assessments. So this was a space that I believe um, Cam and with assistance from Antoine uh, Coffin worked um, and probably was almost the last topic that was brought to the Tamaru all those years ago now um, and, and there's been some work done around that um, Antoine completed a literature review he also started work on um, a review of significant Māori areas across the Tamu um, so that was an exciting piece of work that um, it got to a point of, of a draft and, and then paused so there'll be a need um, to uh, pick that work up again and, 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 and look at that further transportation modelling and reporting still uh, remains a key element, particularly how this growth era links in with the town centre next door and Wada Waraki and the work going around at the um, Papama East Interchange. Infrastructure assessments as well is something that we're looking at closely, not only from a climate change perspective, but just a resilience um, perspective and ensuring that all our networks, uh, the, the network that's created in Tatimu can link efficiently with uh, um, existing infrastructure and elsewhere. So as I allude to there, your work is continuing on reviewing and updating some of this technical work, particularly in light of changing national direction and updates, um, most recently around sea level rise projections. And the engagement. So the piece of work that Cam Campbell and Antoine did um, evolved around a the establishment of a working party and that was a invaluable um, resource to the project in terms of not only providing advice and guidance but providing feedback on a number of planning matters and across 2017-18 and into the start of 2019 <clears throat> that working party was meeting quite regularly there was, however, a, a request in mid-2019 for that working pay to pause. Um, and my understanding around that was just in terms of issues that that working party were experiencing in terms of the uh, the landowner issues for the Tumu Kaituna 14 block. So with that in mind, engagement on the project directly with that working party and um, uh, paused. Council has been working with the trust for the Tumu, uh, for Tumu Kaitina 14 and uh, for, for a number of years. And, and early on, that was built around um, the idea of, as it was with the other landowners, understanding aspirations for the various land blocks. Um, that work um, and that engagement with those landowners um, across the whole growth area and with the trust has continued. Um, in terms of providing updates or where we've got to with the project. Um, Council is also aware of the uh, engagement program that the Trust has been undertaking with its landowners over the last several months, seeking direction on a range of matters, and that that's still ongoing. Um, however, notwithstanding that, and recognising what I just mentioned before, the pause and the working matter, we have not continued or looked to carry out any further engagement until the matters that the working party sought to have resolved were resolved. So that's where engagement in that respect is paused. So next steps in future engagement, um, obviously in terms of, uh, in addition, sorry, to carrying out updates on technical reporting, um, council would welcome the opportunity to understand how engagement for this project could be recommenced. Uh, the, um, Recommencing engagement would be um, a great opportunity for the sharing of that information that we have done over the last um, 
three years in, in terms of refinement, um, reflection and, and getting some um, further direction on how that work could be continued. Uh, I, I appreciate that at one point there was the start of some work around a cultural management plan as well. So bringing a lot of that technical work into a space of, of how um, some of the open space areas of the Timu could be managed, um, that, that's an example of a piece of work that would be um, great to start up again and get working through. So I, that, that's, that's all my slides. And in conclusion, it, it's effectively a case of um, welcoming that opportunity to have a further discussion on how engagement could be recommenced. I'm not suggesting that we start engagement because I, you know, I don't know if we're there yet, but I'm just wanting to understand how we could do that in the future. So that, that's, the, that's the updates and I'm happy to take any questions. Brad, you, you mentioned that um, part of your continuing study is um, regarding sea level rise. Um, what, what's informing you on that? The most recent updates from the Ministry for the Environment that's come out in the last couple of weeks have introduced uh, new sea level rise projections across the whole country. So those are critical in terms of um, coming up to speed with where the guidance is now heading in terms of sea level rise projections. So one of the critical elements to that recent update, as far as I understand, is the ability to consider vertical land movement as well. So how much the land is rising and, and the creation of what's termed relative sea level rise. So the difference between um, not only the, the sea level rise itself, but what the land's doing in, in relation to those. So that, that's that's a key piece of work. So we've already done a lot of work around um, the impacts of sea level rise on a number of natural hazards. Uh, and that's been built off the, the previous 2017 guidance to local government. And, and now as this project continues, um, there's new advice and, and guidance that comes out that really should be reflected. So that... Dean, then, Bill. Okay, um, th thank you, firstly. Um, I, I suppose I, I just want to uh, pick up on um, uh, engaging and, and how that might happen with the uh, in the sense that uh, we, we have a working plan, which is kind of a, has a time frame of about 10 years, and there may be pro projects within that that might be able to align to parts of uh, what's happening here on the river. So just wanted to kind of bring that up for a bit of a look on your behalf. And, and, and that might be how we engage on, on particular projects. In there. It might be able to go now rather than later in preparation, they talk of Thank you. Cool. Um, thanks, Chair. And not, not a question, but really a comment in terms of um, letting um, members know, and, and some of you may um, understand it already, but the, the City Council is supporting work at a high level um, up above the, the, the planning um, that um, Brad's outlined in terms of work between the, the trust and the landowners. Um, because as highlighted earlier, I think that relationship was rather fraught and, um, and as has been outlined, there's no point proceeding along a planning path and engagement until... Um, some work had been undertaken and what that relationship may look like because that's actually fundamental in terms of what happens into the future. So I understand um, that um, by the end of this calendar year, um, th there may be some progress in, in, in that space. I'm just uh, making general comments, Chair, as opposed to getting into the detail, given that's still a work in progress. Um, I understand. Mukoira, you've got your hand up. Although I can't see you on the screen, so I don't have oh. mine. Oh. 
Thank you for your um, pretty stunning mihi too, I must say. Uh, I was pretty impressed with that. Um, just a couple of questions, um, just in terms of uh, Anton's um, paper. Are we able to have that sent to us, sent out at all, or is it like publicly available? Uh, Anton's done quite a few papers. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the, the, there's been a, a, a literature review that Antoine did, um, and that informed some of his later work, which has included a, a, a draft of a significant Māori area review across the Timu. So the, the literature review, um, <clears throat> excuse me, is, is definitely available. Um, it, it, it brings together the um, the CIAs that were that were produced um, as well. Uh, the, the the significant multi area review is very much a, a draft at this point in time, and and that would definitely be something we would um, be interested in, in further engaging on. I, I I don't see an issue with providing the draft of the significant multi area review. So. I, in fact, I'd, I'd like to put it out there <laughs> so people can see what's been done and what's been looked at because um, not only is the work looked at refining and redefining some of those existing areas, but the potential for new ones as well based on some of that information. So then it's really exciting stuff. Cool. Okay. Um, hey. Sorry, Madam Chair, just a quick, another quick one. Um, uh, any minutes, notes or reports from that um, working party, uh, is that available as well? Just to see kind of uh, their progress and yeah, kind of their, maybe their thinking and all of that kind of thing? Absolutely, yep. So there's, there's minutes of all the, up to the, I think it was July 2019 was the last um, hui. So those minutes are all available and, and can be made available, absolutely. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Kia ora. Jay. Thank you. <clears throat> just a, a thought, and it's um, just something to consider for the 340 hectares of land that's not developable. I understand indeed might be able to um, elaborate on this, this, that there used to be a significant kahikatea forest along that coast, mm. and that might offer opportunities um, to re-establish that land. <coughs> And their landowners could then get the carbon credits, which gives them a real, you know, there's be, be very many benefits if we look at that as an opportunity. It would be amazing to have a, um, to rebuild that kahikatea forest along that coast. Any other questions? No questions. Uh, I guess just a statement from me, I guess, um, and I think, you know, uh, we, we all sit on councils here, the majority of us, and really taking the learnings from this project. And I think one of the biggest learnings that I'm hearing from what you're saying to me is that with the existing urban development um, we've got going for the Tauranga urban area is great, but what we're also noticing now is the urban sprawl out into the rural areas where we find a predominance of Māori land. And I think what councils now have to consider is that the first base is Tangata Whenua and those landowners. You know, in hindsight, hindsight's a great thing. If we had gone down that track, it may have alleviated some of the costs that's been injected into this project since the beginning. And really, some of that resourcing could have been better focused on engaging and consulting with Tangata Vena, just a piece of uh, advice to us all. Kia ora, in that vein, we'll, we'll move to you, Richard. Uh, tēnā koutou, kōra, chinkonu, ahau. 
Um, I'm a project manager in the water space at Tauranga City Council, and I've been involved in the Waiati water supply scheme in some shape or form uh, since about 2019. Um, of late, uh, a lot of my focus has been working with the Waiati Kaitaki Advisory Group um, as, as the interface uh, from TCC into that group. And I, I guess acknowledge uh, Councillor Scrimmager and um, Commissioner Wosley uh, here at the table who are members of that group and, and also Amokera Tiamo uh, who is online. I'll briefly touch on construction, but um, I guess a lot of the, because of my involvement uh, recently, um, a lot of what I'll talk about is centered around the Kaitak Advisor Group and what's coming out of that. So uh, in terms of construction, uh, the intake, which you can see on the image on the left, is largely complete. And we're in a phase that's called pre-commissioning. We're, we're working through testing out um, the facility making sure that, that that when we ask it to do certain things, it does them without um, falling over or breaking down and, and nothing's going wrong. So the team's working really hard on, on commissioning of that facility at the moment. We have um, turned those pumps on and pumped water from the intake up through the water treatment plant, um, but that water has been bypassed through and then returned back uh, to the Awa via um, one of the streams that, that comes back into the Kaituna uh, just by the Waiari intake. Um, the water treatment plant itself, um, that's progressing. We are looking at moving into commissioning um, up there in late September, October. And our, our program at the moment is that we'll be looking to move into a period of proving with the, the whole scheme in October, which will mean that we'll be taking water from the Waiari and putting it through the screen, treating it, and and um, putting it into our water supply system and delivering it to the community. So it's an exciting step for us. Um, this is the largest um, program of work that Tarang City Council has undertaken to date, um, soon to be overtaken by the Civic Centre redevelopment, I understand, but um, nonetheless, we'll, we'll hold on to this one in the water space a little bit. Yeah. Um, and we're working, you know, really hard with community engagement out there, um, telling the federal engagement as well around the plant and what have you, and looking to stand up some um, some site visits for for the, the wider community and telling the federal specifically um, in the new year. Once once we're in a space where where we can do that that safely and and actually demonstrate, you know, how how the scheme works and what it's doing. So out of um, the joint resource consent to take water from the Waiati for the Waiati scheme came um, a condition that requires council to, or the joint consent holders to measure the effects of on the Modi, Modi water of the Waiati um, from the water take. Uh, to that end, um, TCC engaged with Dr. Kepa Morgan to help us develop um, a way to achieve that measurement, um, and that's based on Kepa's um, modiometer model, which looks to um, understand from from a Māori perspective the effects on um, the variety of dimensions, which align with the the four well beings um, entrenched in the local government act, um, and, and Kepa's translated those into um, uh, Māori dimensions, being you know. Iwi, Hapori, um, Waiari ecosystem or environmental, and Fano Modi, that economic dimension as well. Um, we've had um, quite a number of Wananga since 2019 with Tanga parties, um, Waitaha, Tapuika, um, Ngati Whakaui, Kimakatu, and Mokopuna Tiamahi to, to work through the development of um, indicators for the various dimensions and thresholds for those indicators so that um, once this model goes live, we can actually feed that in and, and understand what um, what the current state of, of Modi for the Waiati is. Um, at the Waiati Kaitak Advisory Group meeting on the 10th of August this month, um, the, the, the Kaitak Advisory Group endorsed moving the Modi model from um, development into implementation. So 
it's a good step. Great to have support of those Tangana Whenua parties to and the CAG uh, generally to, to move this um, and, and to, into effect. Um, now's the time. It, it will be uh, an iterative and ongoing development process of the model. Um, it'll be refined over time. And we've got a good base set of, of threats, thresholds and indicators in there. Um, but I guess our view is that that we will continue to wānanga with Tangana Whenua parties to, to refine and develop that and understand are we actually measuring what we need to measure and measuring it in the right way as well. So I've just got a couple of slides here with just a small selection of um, uh, indicators and, and thresholds associated with them. So we haven't got to the point of scoring any of these indicators just yet, um, but that, that is part of that implementation phase. So we can see um, some cultural indicators that, that we've developed with um, Tangana Whenua. And the next one is um, Hapori indicators. So a small selection, there's um, quite a range within the model. I, um, and I've provided a link um, in the presentation that you can see there. So that'll take you to the KITAC advisory report that was put up to the CAG um, on the 10th. And it has the full um, indicator set um, as part of that report as an attachment. So if, if anybody wishes to go in and have a look at that, then they're most welcome. Another part of the piece of work that we've been doing with um, through the CAG, through the Tangana Whenua members, is, is discussing with them how we recognise um, Tangana Whenua, Mana Whenua connection to the Waiari in a meaningful way to and in an ongoing way. So in working with the reps around, Tangana Whenua reps around, what what do they see as as, as opportunities for, for for recognition in the cultural sense? And more than just um, PO or, or what have you, but uh, in, a, in a broader kind of meaningful way. So the, the key themes that have come through up here are, are that, you know, that involvement in, in monitoring um, of the ecological state of the Waiati, um, some discussion around education to build capacity, um, regeneration of, of, of the Awa, of the riparian uh, margins as well. Um, very strong theme around access to the Awa um, and then that underlying through that is that support for the Modi model and its implementation. Um, so TCC, we're, we're in a position where we have some capital budget allocated to um, support this initiative um, and in an ongoing fashion, we are also looking at how we can um, support that through operational budget so that we get that long-term kind of benefit um, and engagement with Tangana Whenua um, through this project. And, and as we move from the state we're in currently, which is delivery of the scheme, into the operation of the scheme. So, so by the end of this calendar year, we'll, we'll, we'll be we'll finished delivering it and it will be into operation. So starting to look into the future for that. Which then, I guess, leads us to alignment with um, Te Tinea Tuna, so the, the action plan for, for the Kaituna. Um, and I guess I'd acknowledge, firstly, Dean um, came, Dean and Alva came to the Waiari Kaitak Advisory Group um, quite some time ago, I can't remember the exact date, and, and talked to us about uh, Pataka Kai, um, and, and there was a commitment at that time to, to work together. Um, I think COVID and, and other things have got in the way of that, but we're, you know, we're coming through that now and, and our focus, as I say, is shifting into, into operations and, and working with you know, our various stakeholders and, and other parties to kind of move on to, to something more meaningful and, and working in, in conjunction with Tomato Kotuna where we can to advance some of the, pro the projects that are up there that, were, that, that I've identified just reading through the action plan. I mean, if there's others that, that I've missed, more than happy to... Um, discuss those and understand um, where any other opportunities lie. But our focus going forward will be working with the likes of Tamaru and Tangna Whenua and Western Bay Regional Council um, to, to ensure that, that we leave the Awa in a better place, that we support you know, the principles of Te Mana Otiwai and Te Tiri. Answer questions, thank you. Thank you. Um, there was some concern earlier on in the year um, that the prolonged dry 
period had impacted on the flow of the Waiari and therefore on the ability for you to take the amount of water um, uh, under your consent to um, supply the water supply of Tauranga City. So with the um, generous amount of rain that we've been having lately, is that bounding back? Are you quite confident that you've got the flows that you need now? Okay, so there's kind of two parts of that. Um, one, NEWA have been um, undertaking flow monitoring for us as an independent party. Um, because of the, the dynamic nature of the stream, their flow gauging um, fell out of calibration and it was actually reporting the stream flow as being lower than it actually was for a period of time, which um, obviously is not a great thing and, and caused quite some consternation amongst TCC and, and the Kaitaka Advisory Group, which is quite understandable. Um, the, 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 I mean, the rainfall that we're having, the, the, the science that we have suggests that recharge takes um, between one and two years to, to become apparent in the streams. Um, the streams, all our um, catchment source streams were on a downward trend because of those, um, those number of dry years that we've had. We do expect them to recover. Um, the YRD itself um, has held up quite well and, and the, the, the base flows that, that exist within it are well within kind of the range that we need to be able to take water from the stream. Um, the, the the recent floods has that created any damage or anything with with the intake part? I'm only mentioning because there's a huge log that goes from one bank to the other bank, and that might have come down by the floods. Uh, no, no damage to the to the intake facility itself. Um, obviously, you can see in that photo, it's a very recent photo, there's a slip in the kind of middle right um, that, that hasn't affected us. Um, the stream did come up over that the lower platform you can see there. Um, and, and one of the big rainfall events we had in July, um, but it's well below kind of what the facility's been designed for. So. So no damage, a bit of um, bit of sediment on the ground, um, but nothing that, that we can't manage in that respect. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's a little bit unusual. I'm not a member, but I just have a quick question from a staff perspective. I noticed one of the Modi indicators in the Modi model was the quality and width of riparian planting between the intake and the confluence. Um, have you been in um, consultation with my staff about opportunities to put in place environmental programs with landowners along that stretch? Uh, not yet, but we certainly will be. Obviously, we'll just come through the development of those indicator sets and the thresholds, as in um, they were just finalised in July. So we haven't quite got to that point yet, but absolutely we'll be talking to, to you, Pim. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. And not a question, but again, a, a comment. Um, and, and in terms of the range of initiatives that, that Richard's um, outlined in the presentation, um, I suppose it's just keeping an eye on some of those matters, particularly with the Three Waters reforms. And then if that does proceed in the, the current or similar form, how um, those initiatives are well anchored and carry on into the future, given there will be another entity. Um, and we'll open this facility in the not too distant future, we'll be handing it over to, to someone else. So I think that's something we're also um, aware of in terms of that, that longevity beyond um, the current responsibility lying with the, uh, the councils. Mokoera, your hand is up. Yes, kia ora. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if these are questions as, as so much as uh, maybe statements or concerns. I'm seeing um, uh, a report uh, being emailed out um, by Jennifer, and it had um, photos and stuff of um, staff having a site visit to, I'm, I'm guessing is the intake um, uh, structure, uh, pretty, um, not worrying, but along that vein, 
as to why was no tangata whenua uh, or iwi reps um, even invited uh, to that visit. And, you, and now you're just bringing up that we'd probably have to wait until the new year with um, general public. Well, that's not the greatest word. Um, yeah, so I found that a little bit disheartening. Um, do you have any comment on that? Um, oh, I guess I can acknowledge, Mokera, um, your view. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't involved in those, the planning of those visits um, or the undertaking of them. But I guess what I can give you as a commitment is, commitment is that we are committed to, you know, enabling the opportunity for Tangana Whenua to, to generally, more than just um, the committee members from the Kai, the Kai Tauke Advisory Group, to have the opportunity to go through the, the whole scheme and understand it. So, yeah, acknowledge that that there's likely a gap there. Um, won't hide from that, but um, yeah, we certainly are, you know, working, you know, and working to work in partnership with Tangana Fena on this one. Thank you. Thank Aroha mai mokohera, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I just heard you now, yeah. Um, mokohera, can you turn your video back on so we can actually see you, please? <laughs> oh. You're a good-looking guy, so come on, turn it on. <laughs> Thank you. Well, on Thank the you. was pretty good. Thank you. You look good. Um, I just had two questions, and I guess it's it's um, Moko Era has kind of beat me to um, to the gun. And my first question was, how involved the Tangata Whenua in the implementation of what you're doing, and particularly with the um, implementation you're going to be doing with the work you've done around the Modi model. And uh, so my my first question was, how involved are Tangata Whenua going to be in that implementation? Um, so there was one question to you, and my other question was to both of you, both you and Mokoera, and my question was, do Tangata Whenua have projects that are pertaining to this piece of work? And is there a possibility of looking at whatever projects they do have going around how they can be funded to do that. I'll go first. Um, so when when I opened up the discussion or the corridor around cultural recognition with the Tangata Whenua reps of the Kaitaka Advisory Group, um, they clearly indicated they wanted to lead that piece of work, um, and we support that. Um, so. They continue to, to lead and we will work with them on, on whatever comes out of those initiatives. We're, we're at, a, at a point where we, what, what we've got is, is an understanding of, of the themes or the concepts that, that, that they see as supporting cultural recognition. Um, we haven't got to the detail, but that's kind of where we're, where we're going now. And detail from detail will come those um, elements such as, you know, how can we achieve these outcomes that, that that we're all looking to achieve and then how might they be funded. So, yes, I believe that we'll be coming back to a range of um, stakeholders around the table to, to look for funding, Western Bay, Tauranga City, Regional Council as well. Thank you. Mokoira, can you answer my other question? Did you hear what I said? Uh, yes. Um, I think in terms of um, projects, there are... A, range of things um, that I suppose are uh, kind of pretty high on the uh, table is um, taking over the ecology monitoring or even just the monitoring of the hour in a whole itself. Um, with some of the reports uh, we've been given around the ecolog ecological monitoring, um, yeah, we're not sure if it's very effective and it seems very thick boxy especially being it being that it's a an annual thing uh would would kind of like for it to be 
regular, if not full-time employment type of thing. Um, <coughs> there's things that have been popping up within the uh, Modi model um, that can, yeah, that kind of backs up the monitoring as well. Um, but then there's also the things of um, water supply to marae uh, uh, within Te Takapu. Um, mm, there are a range of things, but yeah, I guess there's are the main ones, especially with the with the monitoring. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mokaira. Well thank you, Madam Chair. I'm um, just to supplement what Mokaira said about the ecological monitoring. Um, I guess the knowledge that it's been done on a, a very Western science basis um, to date. Um, and we've heard, you know, feedback from from Tangana Whenua reps around that. And I guess kind of part of what we'd look to going forward is to look at how how can we weave in um, like um, Matauranga Māori, uh, Māori and um, Maramataka type considerations into that monitoring um, and and still deliver what we're required to through our resource consent, but support you know that 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 Māori view of of, of the the Māori of of the Waiati as well. So certainly something that that we acknowledge and, and are keen to explore further. Thank you for that. And I think it's something that all three councils uh, are embarking on, you know, about what we do in our space. So I think, you know, what we should do as three councils is that we should actually share those experiences too of what we're doing with, um, with Tangata Whenua uh, because I think what it also does is that we actually start to join the dots for them in having to deal with three councils on you know on, on a specific project so i think it's great that we're sitting around this table and we do have all three councils representative and we're listening to this court at all because we all need to be be um taking cognizance of what you're saying what tangata whenua is saying and how we then align that to what we're doing and the work that we do so yeah space to watch thank you thank you but, uh, thank you very much thank you, thank you gentlemen um, we're going to move straight into our next presentation, and we have our other presenters online now. Nikiti online. Okay. Are they both online now? We just check. Oh, we do have our both presenters. We've got Christo and Nikiti. Are you both there? Yeah, guys. Oh yes. There's Christo and Nikiti. Uh, Nikiti, are you there? Morena, I. Morena, have you got your video on? I can't see you. I'm being a bit of a bully to this morning with videos. I want to see you <laughs> as well as you. Thank you. There you go. Nga mihi e uh, Well, welcome, welcome to our committee uh, meeting this morning. Uh, we're on a tight time frame, so I'm going to stop talking and pass the rako to you. Uh, so, welcome aboard and kea korua. Thank you very much. Nikite, um, if it's okay with you, can I give an overview of the program um, and then hand over to you if there's anything you want to add? Hi, Nikite. Awesome. Thanks, guys. I'll share my screen. And I know a lot of people get annoyed with people asking, can you see my screen? But I'm going to ask, can you see my screen? <laughs> yes, we can. All good. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for this opportunity to, to talk to you guys. Um, I'm, I'll introduce myself a bit just after I introduce the program. So as Niwa is leading a new MB Endeavor program called Future Coast Aotearoa, um, and the short title is basically Transforming Coastal Lowland Systems Threatened by Sea Level Rise into Prosperous Communities. Um, and you'll see in a, in a short while why we want to talk to you guys. So just to quickly give you an introduction of the, the project leads. This is quite a big project. Um, Scott, uh, Dr. Scott Stevens um, actually wrote and won the, the funding originally, um, but since then got promoted to chief scientist. So then handed over the management of the project to me. Um, but I'm definitely not doing this alone. We're an we're a, we're a awesome research team lead group. Um, <clears throat> and so Darcel, um, Rickard, she is responsible for making sure that Maori research aspirations are properly um, represented in the whole research program. 
Um, then in the physical sciences side, we've got Ravier that's um, leading the, the research with regards to groundwater aspects. We've got Andrew Swales who looks at um, wetland dynamics and health. Um, and then we've got Paula Blackett and Paula Holland that is leading both the social sciences and economic sciences aspect of the project. And all of these I'll flesh out shortly. And then we had Rob Bell leading the adaptation aspects of, of the project. Um, Rob Bell has since then retired um, and Conan Andrews is also on the call. Oh, uh, and the Paulas and Conan is also on the call. So if you guys have got specific questions after the presentation, feel free to direct it at them as well. But Conan will take over what we call research aim three that I'll uh, elucidate a bit more about just now. So <clears throat> as you guys, as we've seen in the previous presentations from this morning already, um, coastal and estuarine systems are very complex, not just as they are, um, but as we're moving into, into the future with climate change and sea level rise, complex problems are probably going to become even more complex. And that is not just with regards to the physical systems, that's also got to do with the economic and social and cultural systems surrounding these vulnerable areas. Um, and these areas are very important for exactly those reasons, um, both the human related and the ecological related um, reasons. So this diagram basically just summarizes some of the issues that we might have, um, especially looking at um, the salinization of groundwater, the loss of um, productive farmlands. Um, and also this project will really look at, okay, we will see change, but how can we prepare for this change? How can we turn calamity into potentially even opportunity? And if we respond quick enough, um, we can be in, in, a, in a really good place by the time that significant changes happen. So what do we mean when we're talking about transforming lowland communities? It basically means to know what, why, where, and when. Just <laughs> it's pretty much all the questions you can ask, right? But those are important questions to ask. Um, the physical aspect of the program will really try and increase the evidence base of sea level rise related risk. Um, and then the biggest part probably of the project is to look at the multi well being evaluation tools. So, what this means is to fold in dynamic adaptive planning, which in itself is a loaded concept, um, and a decision making framework that transparently compare adaptation preferences. Um, so these adaptation preferences should take into, a cost, into account cost, benefits, risk, and opportunities. Now, I kind of always want to highlight the opportunities that it's not all doom and gloom. Um, that's why we're doing these type of research projects, right? Um, and it's, it's across social, cultural, economic, and natural systems. I've got a whole bunch of partners in this project. Um, like I mentioned before, it's impossible for us to do it alone. And it's fantastic to see how all of these organizations are already just super openly talking to each other, engaging, and just um, becoming such a strong force to be reckoned with. Um, <clears throat> this proposal was written in consideration of all of the policies that's already been published. So it's kind of like it, it wasn't just pulled out of thin air. It's actually addressing considerable um, barriers and knowledge gaps that's, that's currently highlighted in um, New Zealand policies. Um, basically, we need the right tools to achieve the whole of system adaptation um, because councils and stakeholders, everyone involved in the coastal lowlands um, need support and need tools that's readily available and can easily be used to make informed decisions, right? It's big decisions that needs to be made. Um, um, so all of the, the whole of system adaptation has needs to be considered um, and being and needs to be kept on being updated based on ongoing climate change related risks. Um, so 10 of the most significant risks that New Zealand will face in climate change has been listed here. Um, and we don't have to go through all of the details because obviously we have, we have this <laughs> time constraints here. But what I do want to highlight is again how it spans from natural, human, economic, built environment and governance. Um, and these are only two points per aspect, but um, it's almost impossible to address these needs and concerns without consideration of the whole spectrum. So what does this research program do? Is we're trying to actually do this 
whole of system approach. We have divided the program into three main research aims just to give us some sort of structure and accountability towards um, a defined deliverable set. Um, so the first aim is the physical sciences looking at exposure to relative sea level rise um, and link compound hazards. The second aspect that, the, that Paula um, Blackett and Paula Holland can speak to are the consequences. So the threats and opportunities relative to sea level rise. Um, and then research aim three is where um, Conan's team comes in where everything is kind of pulled together in example, um, adaptation plan options and, and, and between research aim two and three, um, serious games and things uh, on all of those type of methods to help communicate the risk and really get um, proper plans together. And throughout all of this, really give full attention to Mataranga Maori in a co-development aspect. And that's part of also why we're here today is to, to ask everyone around the table, who should we be engaging with? Who should we be talking to um, as we're planning on doing some research in the Kaituna area? So research aim one, like I mentioned, exposure, physical sciences. So this is also my background. I'm an applied mathematician turned physical oceanographer. Um, so it's the, the nerds sitting behind the computers building the, the models that inform GIS layers. <clears throat> so this is also where my research will be involved. We're looking at developing a national database of coastal wetlands, <coughs> land use and assets exposure to sea level rise. We're planning on building high resolution, time evolving online mapping for, for Aotearoa New Zealand, freshwater, saltwater interface. I mean, this is like really uh, an, uh, in a nutshell, right? These are complex things. Um, and we're also trying to have science advances to understand ecosystem response to habitat, habitat evolution. For example, if you've got infrastructure that isn't adapted quick enough, the sea level rise, you can get coastal squeezing and actually just squeeze ecosystems to death, for example. We need to give consideration to those things. Um, and with all of this, we're trying to identify um, adaptation tipping points and opportunities for wetland preserva uh, preservation and reestablishment. So basically just a whole lot of tools um, and products that will be useful for, for everyone that, that's working and living in these spaces. The consequences is, is where the social sciences and the economic modeling comes in to play. Um, so it's accounting for sea level rise consequences across all four well-beings that we've also heard about um, before our presentation. So looking at the natural, social, financial, and human capital. Um, we're looking at capturing cascade well-being impacts through time using a dynamic economic model that includes non-monetary values, which is actually very important, and Maori worldviews. Um, we're also looking at integrated social cultural values within a spatial risk tool. Again, tool like this project is really driven towards not just blue sky research, but producing usable tools so that non-monetary values can also be included in plan making processes at regional and district spatial level. Third one, pulling everything together. It's super difficult. And I think a lot of, of, of people working in the policy space around the table would know, designing policies over many dec decades is very difficult because there's limited opportunities to experiment and test options. But in a virtual policy environment using artificial intelligence, we can sort of see the future and the implications of different policies. This in itself is very novel. And this is coming later in, in the program. It's a five-year program. Um, but we're really excited about the potential for this aspect. Um, <clears throat> we're also going to look at methods for managed realignment, how to manage coastal restoration and associated land use planning matters. And if it hasn't been clear up to this point, we're really focusing on rural um, landscapes instead of um, the built environment. And it could be built environment within the rural context, but we feel like this, there's not been a lot of attention given to farmlands and ecosystems compared to developed areas. Um, so we're also going to look at how to reconstruct coastal wetlands, when to maintain or ramp up provision of ecosystem services, and then ultimately bring together all the developed tools to um, develop pathway case study demonstrators for, the, for decision makers. So we'll, we'll have these example cases that we can work together with 
through stakeholders to actually see how this can be done given into a, given all of these tools and products that we'll develop. Um, so we'll also have Manu Fenua research partners. We, we have Manu Fenua research partners. So Shuri and Rangi from Te Puaha or Waikato Hapu, um, they're absolute legends and they are, they are well integrated in our, in our research, um, on all aspects of our research actually. So, so, and they really help us to interlink with other research aims, um, together with the biophysical sciences of historic wetlands, link Maori well-being and world views into socioeconomic models and planning for future adaptation steps for the Hapu and Marae. Um, and, and we've just had some initial meetings with them last week, initial workshops, um, and the plans are coming together really nicely. So our case study sites, and that's kind of why we're here, we're thinking of five different case study sites. Um, with the Kaituna being one of them, <clears throat> just also because there's been so much happening in the Kaituna. Um, and from a physical sciences point of view, it's, it's super interesting. Um, from wetlands, groundwater, um, just the estuarine and coastal dynamics, there's a lot to look at. So um, it will be really great to, to work with everyone in the Kaituna um, River Lowlands. Um, from in all aspects that we've been talking about, social, cultural, physical, everything together. Um, and then just on a last note, before I hand over to Nikita, if, if Nikita wants to, to add something that I might have missed, um, we also have implementation working groups. So um, the purpose of these implementation working groups is we really want to make sure, and that's why I keep on emphasizing it, that the tools and products that we develop, develop is actually useful and usable and in a format that's that we can ensure uptake. So we'll have um, quarterly meetings where we present our results and in a structured manner, get back all of the feedback from our implementation working group. This working group is representative across pretty much all fields and aspects of um, coastal and estuarine science and policy um, that we could think of. Um, so that's gonna be really great. And we also have a secondary well, not secondary, we've got two parallel <clears throat> working groups, the second being led by Sheree, to make sure that the tools and products that we're developing is also useful for from a Maori worldview perspective and making sure that um, equivalently we work in um, all perspectives into the research as we're going ahead. So every quarter almost stopping, reevaluating, reassessing, changing if needing, um, maybe look, changing the slant of some research aspects, um, and that's our a proposal of going forward. Um, so yeah, so we're basically here today to ask you guys and Nikita, if, if you can take it further, but we basically just want to ask who do we need to talk to, to make sure that we really talk to the right people um, as we're planning this research in the Kaituna. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Nikita. The most important part for my role in there, other than the technical team that's involved there, is, is the engagement. And the important thing of the engagement before we get to it is making sure that the access <clears throat> and we have that permission. The key part that goes around the three key portals, as, as we've just been um, informed, is there's a there's a big one around the Matauranga Māori. Um, so my my particular um, important role is Matauranga Māori observation, um, and with that observation. The key one that I think would be really, really great, and Paula and the team actually deliver it really, really well, is an interactive aspect where we sit down with Ngai Māori, whānau hapu iwi, and we have an interactive process. Um, Paula's got a, an, an amazing game that we, we play and we're introducing to, to Marae and etc. It's a bit like Monopoly, but it, the consequences are very, very important to encourage to get that observation that we understand over a long period of time and we have noticed so that we can adapt. The consequences of this, of this particular part is really, really important. 
once we get from the observation and, and via the consequences, then we can set up the protocols. And if we're going to stay in the framework of Mātauranga Māori, the protocols are very, very simple in, in a sense, and that's that cultural overlay. Um, that's what I think will be very, very important because it's something that's been overseen and development has happened over the cultural and has been totally missed. Reinventing it, it looks like nature is actually uh, forcing upon us what was in place. There was a reason why, and culturally we can get those answers and work together to adapt to a protocol process to go out the end. Kuna noiho. Kia ora koutou. Kia ora, uh, and thank you for that kōrero. That is certainly something that um, I'm looking, been waiting for um, to come to the fore, and um, looks like you're on to it. So looking forward to what comes out of that mai that you're doing in, in that space around Mātauranga Māori. Um, so ngā mihi kia koe. I'm going to ask the table now, ask for questions or statements that the members might like to make. Well, oh. Um, thanks, Chair. Uh, a couple of questions of um, Christo. In terms of those implementation working groups, is the, the main role of those to actually test the emerging outputs from the, the research being undertaken? I just wanted a bit more clarity around, uh, uh, around those groups. Yeah, of course. So <clears throat> the first the first aspect of the, of the implementation working groups is just to check that we're heading in the right direction. So it's almost the first aspect is we'll show what we have been doing and then what we're planning on doing. And then it's for them to basically tell us, flip guys, you actually didn't think about this. And did you consider the, you know, that type of thing? Because it's so quick to be blind against your own when we when us the research team gets caught up in our own. Mind. So that's the first thing is to identify blind spots. I think, and then Paula Blackett and Paula Holland, correct me if I'm wrong, um, there will be some aspect of, of testing the tool specifically um, in the working groups, but I think for the testing we'll have more specific workshops because you can imagine to work through some of these tools are more than just someone standing in front of a screen showing things. We actually need to sit down with people and work through things. Um, and I think that is definitely planned, but I'll, I'll let Paula quickly um, confirm if I'm making stuff up. <laughs> if either the Paula's of, oh, oh, there we go. Sorry for throwing you in, Paula. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Paula Blackett, um, and yes, Christo is correct. We will um, we will be seeking many many things from the implementation groups, guidance, um, course correction, and specific inputs um, where where they're where they're essential. So there'll be multiple conversations over over a period of, of three to four years, um, and some of the inputs that we'll be looking for will be uh, perspectives, economic data, social views. Um, specific and Mataranga uh, Māori knowledge, which is shared willingly. Those kinds of those kinds of things are what we'll we'll be interacting with people over a course of time. So that probably really doesn't clear it up, <laughs> but it gives you a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of an idea. Um, many things, I think, is the short answer. Yeah. No. No. Thank you for that. And it just gives me a greater sense of 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 how they'll work. Um, second question. The, I think, Christo, you said this is a, a five-year research program. So when the program and of research is completed, um, what, what do we expect to see? Is it just a, um, the research findings or will it then look at a range of actions as a result of that research that's been undertaken? Because I'm always a fan in terms of research providing some clear guidance then for the various parties, whether it's um, Crown, local government, um, Tangata Whenua or whatever, in terms of being able to pick up um, some direction from that research that's been undertaken. No, full on. I think it's, it's both. It's all of it. It's all of the above. Um, we're very much driven towards not just having, so for example, academic papers that sit somewhere, although that won't be neglected. Um, 
because ultimately even in in policy formation and when people have want to follow certain recommendations people also want to know that the underpinning physical sciences are reputable and internationally reviewed so we're not neglecting that so the the academic papers is definitely a part of our output but the focus is on these tools that will be co-developed and that's why like nikita said we're putting a lot of emphasis on co-development and and really develop as we're going on talking, 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 workshops, workshops, talking, you know, to make sure that the uptake is properly done um, and that the tools are properly developed. And by the time that the program is finished, all stakeholders won't be surprised like, oh, look, there's this new tool that you hear, you know, that would be kind of like, I think, a failure of us. Um, we want to, by the time that the program is finished, that all of our stakeholders are very well introduced to the tools and products that we are developing, um, including guidance. Um, and that's also why at the end, this research aim three will, will aim to develop an example um, adaptation um, plan that will work to work through with the implementation group and with our stakeholders. Um, so it's all of the above. It's, it's really driven towards impact. Um, and again, if I've missed something or I'm talking nonsense, please correct me, Paula. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm not going to correct you, I'm just going to add to it. <laughs> um, one of the things that might be of particular interest is um, we are looking to develop what Christo named as the dynamic policy environment. <clears throat> now, we're not entirely sure what that's going to be at this stage, because it, as was mentioned, it's going to be very much a co-development process. But the idea is at the end, we will create an, a, probably a, a, a visual experience where people can test particular policies or particular actions over a period of time and then be able to uh, see what the full range of potential consequences and benefits are of those particular choices. So if you if you take a particular action, just to use an example, um, to let wetlands be free to move and land and to um, or, or sideways out from rivers, we'll be able to see who will benefit from this, how they might benefit, and who will um, who will be potentially affected, and to be able to think through that, but in multiple contexts associated with multiple actions. So it'll be very much an explorative kind of a, a platform that allows people to go, oh, what if I do this? What if I do that? What might happen, and what might be the benefits and costs? So. It will be quite a generic environment that we're going to create, but it will be designed to represent uh, lowlands across the entire, most of the country. So there will be very familiar aspects to lots of people, like lots of, lots of places are having to think about the pros and cons of stock banks the tensions around um, future land uses and all those sort of things. And we'll be wrapping all of that stuff into this dynamic policy environment. So that's probably something that will be of particular interest. And there'll be a whole lot of other bits and pieces, tools, bits of information, guidance all the way along. So it's really just a, an addition to what Chris Drew was saying. If I could add and tag on to that too, Paula, it's it's also about the, the cultural protection and heritage mechanisms. A, we were at the water's edge before we became land people. So there's that too. Um, and it's also about the, the um, future observation of, well, if it is a huge cultural um, sensitive space and issue, can it be can it be moved so it can remain protected, or what do we have to put in place if it can't? You know, just make sure that we signal that it's it's got some sort of system to to recognise it. Kia ora, Paula. Kia ora. thank you, Nikiti, and that's certainly an issue for us here in the bay with our low lying malai on on the shorelines. Uh, you know, of our moana. Uh, you're right. You know, we've been, we were there, and we, and we're still there. But now, we're being challenged with um, a relocation, and it's, a, it's a real mamai caught it all for them to be having. Um, so I guess you know, uh, with all the academia that's coming with us, how do we sit down around the marae to have this conversation, and how speedy do we have to have to act 
Um, you know, where's the solid information that it's going to be happening to us in five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years? Because I'll tell you now, Kui and Komatua, it's almost an implicit, no, we're not moving. You know, so we have to have that conversation and speak to speaking to them because at some time the crunch is going to say, come, whether we're going to have to say, oh, Carl, we have to go. Or we have to move. Um, so, you know, that's, I guess, that's the um, burning issues out at the coal face um, of the how all this court law is impacting, you know, on our uh, constituencies. But thank you for the court law and thank you for the presentation. I don't think. Oh, sorry, we do have one more question. I guess thank you through, through the chair. Um, I guess it's more of a um, statement. I get just a huge thank you for your presentation and just incredibly important um, research that you're undertaking. And I guess feeling really um, lucky that the kaitana is being a part of this because I personally feel that it ties in so well to the kaupapa of, of um, te maru and, and what, what's trying to be achieved here. So I, I'm just super, super stoked and happy that it's, it's going ahead. And I think what I love most about it is, is actionable things at the end of it because I think that's what most people want to understand is, okay, cool, all the stuff's going on. What can we, what can I do, what can our marae, what can our town, what can, whatever, what can we do? So having these actionable things is really important. So I guess for me, it's a huge thank you. And just the lucky last thing. Madam Chair, I just, just tell you, I'm just hooking my trailer on to Nick. And uh, I suppose, uh, well, to me, to take to me, to me, to me, to me, to me, to me, to me. Uh, I suppose what, what I'm looking at is timing, uh, communi and, and communication. How how have you or do you have a communication plan? Obviously, uh, Tim Timok is is a um, is able to, uh, but um, uh, Kitty, uh, uh, Nikiti, sorry, you may already know the UE groups to talk to, but I mean, we can help in that way. Uh, there's probably wetland groups as well. I'm thinking Taiapuri, there's, there's a huge group of people. So, how, how that is going to happen? And do you have a, a, a kind of a timing of when you might want that to happen in regards to the Kaitona wetland area? <coughs> oh, and last one. And is there resourcing available? All those who we... I could probably talk about the communication and engagement plan. Um, the resourceful thing would be to, to make sure that we, via the committee and, and via TCC's Māori unit, that we we know the location, we know who to talk to. My own personal networks will always, always be in place, so the communication and engagement plan will be developed, but it'll also need to be confirmed. Um, the other part, I, I think the the team would would need to answer that in terms of the timing. My one is my timing is pretty important um, to getting to the engagement process and getting key people like Scotty Stevens to to be in front. And I'd also like to take Paula as well, so that we can sit down and and see how the best approach is once we've got that communication plan, but definitely in place, team. Uh, once again, thank you for your presentation. Um, you know, it's always um, it's always valuable for us to be um, receiving um, your updates to us and looking forward to further communications. No doubt those will be uh, through uh, Dean, you know, through Mokoira. Uh, we're offering ourselves as a conduit to, to mana whenua, tangata whenua. We do, we do have the hapu affiliates around this table who uh, who fuck up to the kaituna so it's a good um, it's a good platform for you to uh, work beside so um, we're offering that service to you Namihi. fantastic thank you so much everyone uh, okay we're moving quite well with the time um, everybody um, just we're going to go, we're going to jump a couple of our presentations and uh, just move them with the consent of the presenters both who are both here today. And we're going to move to the Tamaru or Kaituna update. And that's going to be presented by Adria Green.
Adria is on Zoom. Is that correct? Kia ora, Adria. Over to you, Adria, on the Tamari or Kaituna update. Morena, everybody. Um, I was engaged by Jane Walden and I've had a meeting previously with Dean um, in regards to updating the um, Temaru o Kaituna website. Um, I believe that um, had some issues at some stage last year and it all fell over. And so now we're kind of reinstating with um, a new design to match some of the other documentation that you guys have already developed for the promotion of um, your co-governance group. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and if anyone, if you could please just let me know that it has shared. Can you please let me know if you can see that? Yes we, yes, we can. Thank you. All right, so this is a reinstatement of the website we had previous um, with obviously the updates to the design template. Um, we've kept a similar navigation style up here with a few changes to make sure it's a bit clearer. Now, I haven't fleshed out all of the projects yet. I've only added in a couple of those um, before moving any further because I wanted to get feedback from the group. Um, so the homepage includes the vision um, and some of the key um, design elements that were developed alongside the documentation. Um, we're streamlining the like the user experiments on experience on the site to make sure that people can find the information that they need more freely, and it gives an in-depth explanation as to into the work that you guys are all doing. Um, so who we are, our projects, plans, and gallery. Again, similar to what was there previously. If we click around, we can start to see some of the information populating as we move through. One of the things I discussed with Dean was integrating some of the different colors um, into the bottom here, depending on the project and that page that it refers to and making sure it matches the coloring with the um, branding that you guys have developed in terms of the headwaters moving down towards the estuary and that kind of thing. So up into here, we have more information about your documentation, flowing through, making sure everything's linking the way it should. And then across into our resources. So these are going to link through to the Bay of Plenty Regional Council website where there's information where people can um, subscribe to keep up to date with the projects that you are running, um, some of your administrative stuff, um, links through to your committee page, an easy place to find all your documentation, and then back into the gallery. Then back over here, more of an explanation, again, pulling some of the assets from the already developed documentation and making it digitalized, uh, digitized for you. Now this is gonna work across iPad, iPhone, any device that you're on. So it'll be, um, it'll view correctly, no matter what kind of browser you're using um, and reinstating this email address that I believe um, dropped off at some stage as well. So. Does anyone have any questions on the design or the content? I guess what I'm seeking from here today is probably the best point of contact in regards to getting the most up-to-date list of projects that you want included on the website. Because, um, yeah, I, as I said, I'm reinstating what was on the previous website, but um, I don't think that had been updated for some time as well. So we might need um, someone to become a point of contact for me for the most up-to-date information. Any comments or questions around the table? Um, I'm going to hand to Pim. Yeah, kia ora, Adria. Um, kia ora. <laughs> hey, there are, first of all, a couple of things. There's a, there are a few other annual reports, so you could maybe, yes. um, we can give you access to them. And then my Brilliant. thinking is that the best 
contacts for project information would be mm -hmm. Jane Walden and yes. potentially Fiona Wood in our Fakatani office who prepares the uh, status report for every meeting of Te Maru. Okay, um, excellent. And then between them, you'll be able to get access to the latest and greatest information on each of the of the kaupapa in Te Tini Atuna. Oh, brilliant. That's what I'm after. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your presentation. No worries. Thank, thank you. you very much. Kia ora. <laughs> Okay, moving along, folks, I think we're winning, but uh, we're just going to have a little jiggle in the uh, agenda and we're going to move to those items where we're needing to um, receive recommendations. So we're going to move first to the Chair's report. Because oh. we've got to move something in your report. <laughs> <laughs> I can't have that thing. Um, oh, okay. So we, we, we have a notification received from Te Komiti Nui o Ngāti Whakaui. This is in regards to a new alternate representative. And that's Karina Te, te, uh, te Awa Bird. Uh, so we, we've received that letter. Have we? Yeah. So we've received that letter. She will be taking the place of Manu Pini. Uh, so there is a, uh, we need a resolution or someone to move. Are uh, the acceptance of that? Is that, yeah, through you, Madam Chair? Sorry. We're looking for a mover that confirms the appointment of Karana Te Awa Bird as the alternate member representative for Te Kumuti Nui or Ngāti Whakaui, replacing Manu Pene. Can I have a mover, please? It's a move. Aaron, thank you. Mokoera, second. All those in favour? Sorry. Oh, aroha mai. Mokoera, you cannot vote. Why? Oh, aroha mai. Uh, Mokoera, you are an alternate, so I need to have the uh, the formal members. So I'll take Aaron as the first and Nick as the seconder. All those in favour, say aye. Aye. Thank you. Carried. Okay, just uh, the, the, the next point, uh, I just wanted to mention the Local Government uh, Governance Professionals Forum. So I participated uh, as the chair for Tamaru in, in this piece of work. Uh, it's basically councils around the country looking at co-governance and how it moves, whether, whether it's formal, informal. So uh, this is a continued um, discussion that we're going to have. I think uh, uh, the, the request from councils around the country and in Australia is how do these things work? And there's so many different types of modelling. So um, I'm just uh, letting the members know that uh, I'm participating in that on behalf of Te Maru uh, and, and the only other part in here, which I've just added now, is a congratulations to uh, Councillor John Scrimminger. I heard he won an award. And uh, so, yeah, well done. I, th I think the values in that, that that we express in here, you've kind of uh, picked up in your in your practice, I suppose. But uh, just like to congratulate you, John. Thank you for that. Thank you. That's about me. That's all I had. Thank you. Very good. Now I'm going to move us to our next report where we needed to move those recommendations, and that's the Tamari or Kaituna River Authority annual report and budget, which is on page 15 of, a report, of your report, and hand over to Pim. Tēnā koe, Madam Chair. Uh, so this is a little bit of a formality, but the legislation does say that uh, you as an authority need to file an annual report and distribute that report to the members. Uh, so thanks to Jo Watts for her help every year. Um, we've, we've put together the report, which is relatively brief, spanning pages 19 to uh, 21, um, and it just sort of gives a bullet pointed list of the activities and highlights uh, of the authority's work. Um, so if you're happy with that, that's the first recommendation. The second um, matter for discussion is on page 17 of your agenda, you'll see there's a draft annual budget and um, 
you'll see that there are a number of question marks down the right hand side in the secretariat's role. Now I will invite Jane if she's happy to just come and call it all about the work program that she's put forward and had approved by the chairs. I'm not sure whether all members have, have seen that yet, um, but there is quite a lot of overlap between the work that's provided for uh, in Jane's work program and, and the work that Tumaru seeks to achieve. And for example, you'll see that there's no communications budget allowed for in, in the proposed budget. Um, but that is provided for in, in Jane's work program. So Jane, did, did you want to add anything about what's in or what's not in your work, work program at this point, or simply answer questions if they arise? Mention a couple of things um, would be useful. So I've <clears throat> we've got $5,000 in this budget for the Patakakai Project 9 um, potential cost. That's actually for a gazebo, a branded gazebo for Te Maru o Kaituna. Um, those costs can't come out of the Secretariat budget because it doesn't cover capital costs. Um, the other thing the Secretariat budget is um, going to be covering, probably the biggest cost for Te Maru will be a symposium in um, maybe March or April next year. Uh, so it would be good for the members to start thinking about a theme and you know who we might want to have as speakers at, at our symposium. Um, but that's probably the bulk of the cost. There was also some budget uh, set aside for resource consent hearings, um, especially for AFCO, um, yeah, that kind of thing. So I guess the question is, um, should that $5,000 in on page 17, should, should Tamaru provide for that through its own funds, or do you feel as though there's enough funding set aside in the Secretariat budget and that item could be deleted from the draft budget here? As I just mentioned, the Secretariat budget cannot cover capital costs. I know, but the um, engagement of professionals to represent the authority during any hearings or appeals associated oh, with Oh, sorry, you're talking yeah. about that. Oh, yeah, I yeah. thought you were talking about the, um, the gazebo. I know, I think, yeah, we, we've clarified that one, but it's, um, so the first and second items, yep. uh, involvement in hearings, for change five to the RPS, there's ten thousand dollars identified and in involvement in hearings for the F, you know, or, or appeals for AFCO. So there's fifteen thousand there. Should should that be struck out of this draft budget and covered through the Secretariat's work program, or should it be left in here for the authority? I think it's probably covered in the Secretariat budget. I, mean, I think we've got the same amount. Mm. So, Madam Chair, that reduces the total on page 17 from 35 to 20, um, with $5,000 each for the consented takes and discharges project, uh, the Pataka Kai project contribution referred to by Jane, um, project 10, the community connection, and project 13, the Kaituna cultural and historic heritage. Um, <coughs> There's also... Uh, um, can I ask a question? Oh, Why are there no amounts showing in the implementation of other projects into Tini Artuna? Is that because there are none? Oh, still, still being identified. So, so through you, Madam Chair, the, the four projects listed there are the ones that are led by Te Maru or Kaituna River Authority in the action plan. All of the other projects are either led by Western Bay District Council or the Regional Council or a particular area or Tauranga City. And um, so, you know, you, you would be more than welcome, I'm sure, to allocate budget to uh, to help those agencies get the work done, but, but you don't necessarily need to, I don't think. Thank you. Any other thing that you could consider is... Um, and this is sort of jumping ahead in the agenda a little bit, but if you look at page 25 of your agenda in the status report, you'll see that there are two projects that haven't yet been started. One is the Coastal Park Network Project, um, and the second is Project 18, a River Restoration and Enhancement Fund. Now, um, I don't know whether the authority would like to set aside some funds that could be um, bid for by residents or um, tangata whenua in the catchment for restorative work or enhancement work um, and, and that could potentially be a combination of both a portion of the unallocated secretariat funds I believe there's about 8,000 sitting there unallocated at the moment um, and or 
any any specific amount that the authority wishes wish to set aside because as you'll note you've got a budget of 193,000 you made a profit last year of three and a half grand and um, you may wish to put a little bit of money aside if, if you want to kickstart that project 18. So there, there are some considerations for members. Uh, I'm I'm kind of open to that idea that if there are any uh, groups that are wanting some putier to to help kickstart them, that they, they uh, that we um, help support that. To you, Madam Chair, for uh, just a suggestion, um, I wonder if the fifteen thousand dollars from the Secretariat budget should. That was for legal fees. Stay, stay with the, the annual plan budget, and then we release those funds to go towards um, any contestable fund that you want to set up. I'd like to move that, if I can, Madam Chair. <clears throat> All right, we have a move. Did you get that? Do you have to? And can you just repeat what you just said so that our secretary can step to that? I just suggested oh, that. Or we, just can, we yep. might amend the recommendation. Yes. I, I think I've got it correct, but what, what's proposed is a, an amendment of uh, recommendation number four, the bottom of page 15, and that would be rather than adopts the annual budget as it's stated, but amends uh, the annual budget for 2022-23 as follows, and that would be to uh, um, I'm just trying to make up the words on the fly here. D delete the first two line items um, relating to change five and the AFCO consent, and insert uh, in the last row where it says other. Um, Fifteen thousand dollars for Project Eighteen. Yep. Um, I'll have to work with Jenny on the exact wording of that. I was just going to say that, that sounds pretty untidy. Um, Pim, can somebody else give a, do do a better one? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just some flexibility, so I can pick you with it. Okay. Um, So it's looking like we're going to accept the recommendations with the amendment to be made to four, which allows us to amend as has been suggested to us. And while our wordsmiths find the word, the wording that would be most appropriate. I have a suggestion to you, Madam Chair. I think it, you could adopt it as it is, and then the $15,000 contestable fund comes out of the Secretariat budget. That way that this just stays as is. So it'll just be an operational procedure, not we don't have to change. Yeah, it is. It just saves you having to change your resolution for this budget. That's that's fine from my perspective. That that works. So what what you were proposing to do through your work program would be done through the budget provided for by Tamaru, uh, and what Tamaru was going to fund for the contestable fund would be funded through the Secretariat's fund. So all it needs then is an amendment of your work program to reflect that change, and we're all good. Yeah. Any questions from the members? Are we understanding what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just flexibility to use the money <laughs> yeah, and using the proper process, but it looks like we've got it covered under their um, operational processes and procedures. I did have a question. Yeah. The reference to the Secretariat budget, the reference to the Secretariat 
So through you, Madam Chair, uh, the short answer is nothing. Um, but that's potentially connected to our first presentation this morning about Tatumu development, because uh, there was a working group uh, involving Western Bay District Council, the Department of Conservation, um, Campbell Larking, and uh, staff from uh, the Regional Council. And the idea was that all of the publicly accessible areas in and around the lower Kaituna River, whether they be you know, district, city, regional, or dock, would would be sort of packaged together as a regional park. Um, but that that work has kind of been put on hold until we know what's coming through to Tumu. Um, it's not to say nothing can be done because there is still a lot of land on the other side of the river. Um, and we I think I have put it on my to-do list a few times, but it has never quite got to the top. Um, but if someone else wants to kick it off, um, from either TCC or from Western Bay, I'd be happy to support that process. Um, otherwise, it'll it'll hopefully get to the top um, before Tetumu uh, is developed. Well, I might make my own case. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. First of all, and then to happen. <laughs> Just the. Um, off the top of my head, it sounds quite a good initiative, and I just hate to see it lost. And um, and with the change of staff and all of that, the idea may not bubble up. But I'll I'll follow that up certainly from the Tatumu perspective. One of the ideas that members should be aware of is that um, we were going to use the Tamaru Kaituna River Authority brand and um, logo, etc., on the signage and look and feel, so that it was, you know, one of the things that they. It doesn't matter if they're on on Tauranga city land or on Western Bay land or on dock land or on regional land. They're seeing that Te Marua Kaitana River Authority um, kind of insignia throughout. Thank you. Now back to our recommendations. <laughs> Is the report, have you finished presenting the report? Thank you, Pim. Now, those are our recommendations on, am I looking at the right right, on page 15, one, two, three, and four, uh, following our discussion. Can I have a mover, please? Thank you. Seconder. Thank you, Nick. Nick. No further discussion. We're all good. All those in favour, say aye. 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 None against. Carried. Thank you. Okay, Pam. Our next report, where we have recommendations to approve, is the Maru Kaituna Action Plan Status Report with you, Pim. Yeah, thanks again. Um, so you'll be familiar with, with these reports now. I think this is the third one in this format that um, Fiona has prepared. And thanks to all of the staff and representatives who've contributed to it. And, you know, there's a, a lot of work goes into these status reports. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I guess I was hoping I could take it as read, but if you'd like a summary of any particular project or if you've got any questions, um, please uh, go ahead and ask. Maybe just anything specific we should be noting, Pim, in there. Well, okay, but perhaps I'll draw your attention to uh, page 39, and you'll see there um, is a map of kind of landowner engagement in a specific section of the Kaituna catchment that's known as, well, at least here, as the Ford Road Waitapuya uh, subcatchment, and you'll see there that the the purple areas are wetlands that are already under management, some of those having been recently created. The green polygons, which are a little bit hard to see against the green of the general map, 
uh, where environmental programs are signed and underway or completed. Um, and I note that um, the two most or the two largest um, Māori owned farms in that area, Otu Kawa, the Tapawika Enterprise, and um, Te Arawa, um, Management Limited down in Makatu, have both signed up to significant um, environmental programs. Um, the yellow is where we have a draft environmental program for that landowner, um, sort of ready for signing. Orange is we've been there, and um, at present there's there's uh, no no interest or or it's not feasible. And um, and the red is all of the kiwi fruit properties where rather than co-funding work, um, it's just drawing attention to the state of the estuary and the receiving environment and um, those good management practices uh, that orchardists can choose to implement or not that um, can reduce the rate of contaminant losses from those properties. So it's, it's a, I think it's a pretty good example of the, the level of engagement with landowners um, down there. Sorry. Sorry, I forget to turn on my mic. Goodness, um, any qu no questions coming from the table, or are there any questions? Nobody, and none. Mokweta, Erin, Carl. Can I have a move? Uh, thank you, Dean. Moving. Seconder. Thank you, Bill. All those in favour, say aye. aye. Thank you. Carried. Our next report uh, is the Essential Freshwater Policy Program update, page 71 for you and presenting. Welcome, Joe. Kia ora koutou. Kua, Joe Watts, Te Whenua. So um, today, uh, we, so we're up to page 70. Let me go through the... Oh, is that going? For a moment. Uh, we're going through to um, the freshwater update, which is on page 71, I think, of the agenda. Have you got your mic on, Joe? I have. Oh. Is that not working? I'll come a bit closer. Is that a bit better? So... Um, if you turn to um, page 71 on your agenda is the freshwater update paper, which is, uh, I'm still scrolling through the action plan on my, it's cutting in and out. We'll just have to see how I go. Your action plan is a lengthy document with really quite good outcomes coming out through some of those action plans from Titini Atuna. Still scrolling through. Right, so on page 71, it's just an, a quick update as we do each each uh, each Timaru meeting. We bring an essential freshwater policy program update to you about the the more kaituna focused or more tangata whenua focused work that we've been doing in the freshwater space. So this just updates us since last time about um, encouraging iwi to be involved in the freshwater work that we're doing. Um, you'll also note that this is this paper is related to the two letters that uh, Chair Flavel sent out on Wednesday. So there was an ipanui there with two letters. One was about inviting uh, tangata whenua, including te maru, to uh, be involved in the early draft, working draft policy uh, material. And the other one was about the Change 5 hearing, so the RPS Change 5 hearing. Uh, so the paper just touches on those and um, in conjunction with reading the letters, Timaru might wish to consider those further. Uh, the other thing is I have Gemma Maletta here and the part of the paper that is related to the work she's doing is about visions and environmental outcomes. So I think uh, through you, Chair, I think I'll, probably the easiest way would be just to step through the, the two parts of the agenda paper about the letters and then I'll hand over to 
um, Gemma to take you through what she's been doing with the visions and with the help of the Kai Turner group with the hui they had, et cetera. Um, so the first letter was about the draft uh, policy options, and that was about part 2.1 and 2.2 .2 in your agenda. And it's a letter that was sent out to a lot of tangata whenua, to iwi organisations and the co-governance groups about getting involved in the draft policy options, parts of the freshwater uh, work that we're doing. And I guess it's a letter that outlined uh, if you'd like to be involved early, that would be fine. And at the bottom of it, it had a table with links through to each of the parts that we've been working on. And each of the parts at this stage are very drafty. They're very early working drafts. And they're the region-wide parts of the regional policy uh, are the regional plan. So they're kind of quite high level and they're not very Kaituna specific and they're not they're not the tangata whenua parts of the puzzle yet. So um, while the offer's there to in, invite feedback, it might be something that Tamaru um, may think, gee, it's a little bit early for us to um, jump in boots and all here. So um, you'll see in 2.1 there, as, as I've just written there, that one approach may be for Tamaru or Kaituna to request a briefing. Um, we can then provide uh, if there were some iwi organisations or members around the table, we could um, set up a, a hui. Um, it might be a zui for that matter. It might be a bit like the Kai Turner Vision one that we did. We can do it online or in person, whatever you feel is appropriate. And we can bring some, um, so you don't have to wade through all the policy, all the planning gunk that's in those attachments. It's really hard going and it's really drafty. Um, but we can provide you what we did to our councillors. We provided them with some material a bit higher level about each of the chapters and what the key changes are there. So you get a bit of a feel. So you could do that. Or perhaps Tamaru can think, gee, this is early days. We'll wait for the freshwater team to bring the Kai Tuna specific parts and the more Tangata Whenua focused parts. You'll see in the paper that our um, Kopapa Māori team have been working really hard on the Kaitiaki chapter, for example, and that work's not ready, but it will be shortly. So um, as we go through, um, this is our last, uh, Te Maru Kaituna's last meeting before the election. So we haven't got a meeting in that December space yet, but we'll continue to send out um, ipa noi's, um, perhaps through the chair or even perhaps through the freshwater team, making material available so that those that want to be involved can be involved along the way. Um, and it's just trying to use your best time, your, your time wisely, I guess, and work out where that sits. Um, shall we take some questions on that or do, would you like to discuss that first before I move on to change five or? Through the chair. Um... I, like, I love briefings. <laughs> Kapai. And I think that's where we're situated early. So, and um, this being the last meeting, uh, the next briefing would be in the new year. Uh, and uh, I think it's just good for this, this committee or this group to have um, a check on the status of where it's, it's moving. Uh, and at some point, I mean, um, if we're um, advocating Wananga with iwi and that, well, well we can do that, as, as you've mentioned. Um, I just, we just got that um, presentation uh, around the new web page that we have. So that might be a place we can post the panui, mm -hmm. the ipanui as well, because we need to do a bit of comms around that when that goes live as well. Uh, just for a question through you, Chair, um, just on that, if we were to organise a bit of a briefing, do you think it would be kind of around now with those region-wide ones, or do you kind of think that you might wait for the Kaitiakitanga chapter review to come through, or, you know, we could probably, we could do it around now, or we could wait till sort of November, December, um, when that material came through? I will pass that, <clears throat> I will pass that to Dean. 
definitely the Kaitaki. Yeah, I, th- I think uh, that, that's a good start for us. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, Gemma's got some material on the vision, but the other part of the puzzle that's coming is um, a science summary for each of the areas. So a science summary for the Kaitona and uh uh, Nikki Green is leading that out and she she was hoping to have it ready today but she's thinking maybe end of September so I'm sort of thinking maybe once that uh, science summary stuff and the Kaitiaki Tanga chapter review there might be a package of work there that we um, send out a bit of a panui and then perhaps set aside a little kaituna briefing. Do you think it would be a Timaru iwi members briefing or that wider kaituna iwi you know, we, how we invited all of the, the wider iwi with an interest in the kaituna to the vision. Our little vision hui. Either way? Yep. Or perhaps we do that. We'll note that in the minutes. You will <clears throat> you will bring any plan or draft for that to this committee first, though, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. we'll just make yeah. just be a little bit mindful that you haven't got, you know, that there's a bit of a hiatus in yeah. meetings. Yeah, yeah. And we'll still make contact with that Kaituna Iwi members yeah. and that wider um Tangata Whenua far now that we've sent the material out regardless and in the new year. Um, if there's any changes around the Timaru table, we can provide a, a briefing to the new members um, in the new year when you get going. Well, that sounds good. I can see Dean Merton nodding his head. So <laughs> uh, it is about bringing the plan to us and then and joining everybody when you go out. That's the plan. Dean, is that what you were nodding and agreeing to? That's Yeah, there's nodding and agreeing. And everybody else is nodding and agreeing to. So there's our, there's our direction to you. Kāpai. Um uh, so I just whizzed down to section three of the report, which is on uh, 74, and that's just to highlight, that's the other letter that went out is the material about the river, uh, the regional policy statement change five, and you'll remember that's the, that's your change effectively. It's not, not you doing it because you've passed the mantle over to the regional council to recognise and provide for your tier uh, your kaituna he tonga toko iho, the river document in the RPS. So really important kaupapa to make sure that happens in the strongest way possible. So uh, the letter that was attached just says that um, you guys put a submission in support. So in being uh, te maru and being the co-governance group for the river, uh, I see that the team that's leading that hearing out has given you the first spot on the hearing on the 11th of October. So 9.30, Te Maru's up. Um, you, and if uh, the letter's there, um, so Anton Coffin is the chair of the hearing panel there. And you'll remember that uh, this forum uh, nominated Rawari Faulkner as the iwi nominee. And so the panel is... Anton Coffin, Rawari Faulkner, and the council rep there is um, Councillor Von Dadelson. So the three, so you've had a good input in there to who the panel are, and they've put you up first. So that's giving you the money that you need to uh, really put some support there if you'd like. Um, the minute that was attached to the letter talks about some very key dates if you were wanting as a forum to write evidence and put further evidence in. So you might want to think about whether you want to do that or whether you just want to be there in, in person and who might go and those sorts of things. But there's some really key dates there. And um, if you were wanting to construct some evidence, you'll have to get your skates on. <laughs> I think it's got to be in with the... in. Um, there's a, quite an exchange of evidence there, and I think it's... Um, Let's just check before I tell you wrong. Um, so if you were to provide extra evidence more than your submission, it would have to be in by the 13th of September. So you've got roughly a month to put that in. And all the material will go up on the website so you'll be able to see um, the staff recommendation stuff goes up on the website on the 23rd of August. So next week you'll be able to see whether 
the staff have recommended to accept some of the strong parts or if they, if they looked at weakening some of the parts, you'll be able to see that on the evidence on the website and then there's some key dates there to keep mindful of there. I don't know whether you want to have any call at all about that. I'm, I'm not personally involved other than to uh, share with you the information and those key dates just to make sure that you're aware of those. Cool, so I think I'll um, just uh, through you, Chair, I'll invite um, Gemma Moletta to talk to you about the work that she's done since our Kaituna Vision Hui and the, and the material we've brought here in the past. Thank oh. you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just thinking um, at some point for, for uh, Change 5 and, and to Madhu's um, submission, um, might want to work, we might want to work together, Jane, and we might do a bit of a quick review of what we said against what has uh, others said, just to see in regards to what you've just mentioned around the wording. And so we might just do a bit of a review kind of the next week or two, and then that will then indicate whether we need to make an additional submission. And I, perhaps I didn't mention that that's quite related to the budget item. You just, you know, you'd yeah. already just put your $10,000 against that uh, change five. So you've got some putia there if you needed to act swiftly. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that timing there, that material will come out on the 23rd of August on the website, the staff recommendations. You'll be able to see which way the staff are recommending the panel go. So you'll get a good feel for uh, whether, whether there's uh, the, the, the strength is being maintained or whether it's being watered down. Kapai. Tēnā koutou everyone. Um, I am just here to very briefly talk to you about what I've been up to um, in the MPSFM space um, and I've got a handout to give you at the end of this and that can be emailed to all the members that aren't in the room as well. Um, so last time I presented to you on um, a, an example vision um, and since then we've also had a combined iwi hui uh, for the kaituna. Um, we have had participate online engagement feedback, which just closed at the start of August. Uh, and so what I'm looking to share with you is uh, in the handout, uh, we've got the example vision um, that was shared with Iwi earlier in the year, um, an alternative vision, which is a more high level overarching vision and a start of a discussion about environmental outcomes, which is um, not one I've presented to you on. Um, so the alternative vision is based on the Kaituna River document with additions to acknowledge the use values um, of freshwater and um, the receiving environment being the Makatu estuary, um, closer to finalising what our vision might look like. We'll work on Te Reo translations. Um, and then the opportunity with this alternative vision is to sort of uh, highlight some of the biggest challenges slash improvements that you're after. What are the biggest goals um, that we want to achieve in that freshwater management unit? Uh, so the alternative vision, I'll just read it out. Uh, the Kaituna River is in a healthy state and protected for the use and enjoyment of current and future generations. And the Kaituna River will contribute fresh water to Te Awa o Ngātoro Irangi uh, Makatū Estuary, which improves the health and well-being of the estuary. Uh, we haven't um, come up with any suggested timeframes at this stage uh, and that's one of the things that we'll need to work through um, over the rest of this year and, and next year as well once we kind of uh, get an idea of the implications of how long 
um, our goals will take to achieve. Uh, we're in a fortunate space in the Kaituna in that there has already been a lot of work done through the Kaituna River document and um, community group process that's already gone ahead. Um, and so we're reasonably confident we know um, what everyone wants, um, improve lowland drain, canal health, thriving, accessible, safe mahinga kai, safe swimming, um, enhanced and increased extent of wetlands um, and a whole bunch of others. So um, the work that is in the little paper handout that I've got will sort of uh, turn the, the, what we want into planner speak. So I apologise in advance if it's not overly exciting to read. Um, but really what we're looking for is some outcomes that we can work towards and some actions um, similar to um, what you've got in Tatini Atuna already. So um, where there are um, overlaps, I've identified in that in the commentary that um, you've already got projects that work towards some of those outcomes. Um, and lastly, I just want to give you a little update on the online engagement um, feedback we got for the Kaituna. Uh, we had nine contributions and they covered a range of values, including recreation, natural character, mahinga kai, fishing, economic uses. Um, and the entries sought the restoration of Modi and ecosystems, safe swimming, thriving fauna, including kakahe, koda, and tuna, uh, clean drinkable water, and commercial outcomes as well as water quality improvements. So an acknowledgement of the, that it is a significant food production area as well. Uh, they, there was also some suggested measures on how to achieve um, improvements, um, such as wetland treatment of drain water, native vegetation along banks, pest control, treated discharges, land retirement, synthetic fertilizer controls, planted riparian margins and reduced stock numbers. In the majority, sought improvements within the next 10 to 30 years um, with one seeking a 50 year time frame. Um, and that's just sort of a start point for where people are and, and we'll work through those time frames as we as we look at what um, target attribute states we might have, uh, what the what the numbers are going to be and how we're going to have to get there. Uh, so that hopefully would be your first presentation next year would be um, covering everything. Questions? Thank you, Gemma. It sounds um, a lot of work, a lot of work. That's great. Uh, any questions from around the table? Or I mean, statements? Yes, I do that in our meetings too. <laughs> um, I don't have an issue with you know, what's up there, but it's just which improves the health and well-being of the estuary by whatever date. In terms of measuring that achievement, in terms of what the health and well-being or what the improvements to the health and well-being are, are those measures or approaches or whatever going to be clearly outlined in the substantive document? So it's actually knowing when you've got there at a point in time, because it's going to, you know, it'll be some journey. And my having been involved in the Waikato and their plan change one, um, it was many decades in terms of... An 80 year time. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But it's really how you have then, how that assessment or improvement is measured and anchored. Yeah. Um, through you, Madam Chair. A great question. Um, so we were just discussing in the last couple of days, because this is sort of hot off the press, um, 
in terms of improving the estuary versus improving the water that goes into the estuary and whether or not that will make a measurable difference. So that sort of science side of things is still coming. At the moment, um, our scientists are recommending a number of measures in the estuary in terms of sort of mud content. The other ones escape me off the top of my head. Um, the Te Marua Kaituna would have had uh, material some time ago back when we were working with the community group and uh, you might remember that uh, Josie came and talked about uh, the real change, really significant changes that are needed for the estuary health and so our scientists, um, they've said publicly at the Kaituna community group and at this forum there's some really significant changes, bigger changes than the Rotorua Tiarua Lakes area. So I think for the Makitu off my head, it was off the top of my head to, to achieve moderate ecosystem health in the estuary, so not pristine ecosystem health in the estuary, was in the order of 63% reduction in nitrogen, and it was about 30 something for phosphorus. And uh, the the scientists have been working on whether they can put a put a sum on the sediment. That was one that they were really struggling with, but the sediment component is really big. So that's why we've had to had to split out what uh, Gemma was mentioning. There's, there's there's measures for making the water in the river healthy and swimmable, but what that river then contributes to the estuary is quite a quite a big ask and um, even if we did really really good management practice etc for the properties in the river it may only go a little way for the estuary so yeah there's some careful words there and there's going to have to be a lot of science about how long how to measure all those parts I'm not sure that that's really answered your <laughs> answered your question commissioner Horsley do appreciate the challenges in, 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 in this space, but it's making sure that at the end of the day, there is that understanding and measurement in terms of the achievement of the health and well-being. Yeah, so there will be um, measurable numbers in the plan for um, both the river and where the estuary one sits is still a work in progress given it's coastal um, and we've got two different plans. Thank you. Uh, on that note, I'm going to, I want to thank you ladies for your presentation. Um, it's always good to keep us up to date on what's happening happening in the space. Oh, sorry, sorry, just one more. I've missed um, Mukweta's hand on the screen. Kao uh, koe Mukweta. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in Tena uh, your presentation there, um, I um, didn't manage to get onto any of your um, Zooms uh, with technical difficulties um, those months ago. Um, awesome uh, kaupapa within there, um, and I'm going to, again, make my ignorance uh, demonstrated, uh, but uh, what are we going to do in terms of Rotorua's wastewater? Um, is there any scope, and I'm, this is what I'm guessing to the wider table, uh, again, I'm really new to any of this kind of, uh, to this whole space altogether, but, you know, we need to uh, put some kind of onus and responsibility back on Rotorua um, wastewater. Uh, but then also, um, you know, we're looking at the Kautuna or Te Awanua Tukuika. Um, however, there's no kōrero at all also in terms of uh, the tributaries and there are, I think, Neke Atu Te Rua Te Kau, I think, yeah, there's, there's pl plenty of pl tributaries anyway and um, most of these tributaries, all of these awa and streams are lined with either farms or orchards. Um, so we can do some awesome things with um, uh, riparian management and um, all sorts of things in terms of along the banks of the Kaituna, 
and within it, but then there's the tributaries that have um, yeah, lots of detrimental factors uh, impacting them as well. Those are the three big words I know, I'm just trying to sound something kind of less. Sure, no, um, yeah, in terms of Rotorua waste management, wastewater management, and then like the tributaries. Um, what's the question there? Gosh. Can anyone take uh, 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 with your questions? Uh, we have the staff here uh, can answer. So um, I'm going to hand firstly to Pim. So, Gemma and Joe, if you'd like to answer, you can, but otherwise I'm happy to answer this one. Um, I can talk a little bit about the Rotorua, Te Arua, uh, the Rotorua wastewater treatment contribution. So um, you're quite right there, Mokera. Uh, the, the, the top of the Kaituna is influenced by the water that comes down from Lake Rotorua and Lake Rotuiti. And um, they're doing their part up there. Um, so they have a thing called Plan Change 10, which is... Uh, that's about making sure that the water that the kaituna receives at the top of the orchidy, um, that they do their bit by reducing the nitrogen up there because they've also got too much nitrogen for their sensitive lake. Um, and as you point out, that, that in turn uh, ends up being dumped into the top of the kaituna. So the wastewater treatment plant uh, has its nutrients measured as part of their consent. And uh, very soon they're in the throes of going through a process, a new consent, and you might um, you might have been in those conversations where at the moment the Rotorua wastewater treatment plant sends its effluent, treated effluent, up into the uh, Whakarewarewa forest. And the idea is that they're going to be moving away from that, but they have to do their part of the puzzle so that they're pr providing, uh, so that the effluent is treated to the right uh, right standard to uh, not unduly compromise the water that's going into the top of the Kaituna. Um, just on the um, Kaituna River, um, what we probably don't say there is um, the Kaituna River there is defined as um, including all the tributaries. So your co-governance area includes not only the Kaituna, the main one, but, you know, Mangarewa, Paraiti, uh, Parua Whenua Mia, all of those ones, and including all the canals and all the ones that don't look so like they are uh, that part of the river, all in that. Uh, so when we say the healthy state and protection of the Kaituna River, it's the whole system from the gates down. Don't want to add anything more there, Pim. Yeah, kia ora Joe. Um, and kia ora mokuera. Um, what, one of the things that's surprised me in the 10 years that I've been working in the Kaituna catchment is the relative um, sources of those contaminants. So when, when, the, when the river water reaches to Tumu, um, just before it goes into the estuary, it's carrying a nitrogen concentration of about 0.85 parts per million. Uh, but when it goes through the Orchidae gates, it's at about 0 0.28 parts per million. So it's relatively low when it comes out of Lake Rotuiti, relatively clean. And the, the reason that it's still an issue there at the lower concentration is that lakes are the most susceptible uh, ecosystem type to nutrient contaminants. And so that might be a high-ish level for the freshwater lakes. It's not necessarily, if we had a nitrogen concentration of 0.28 at Tatumu, we'd be... Uh, we'd be dancing. Um, most, of, uh, most of the estuarine indicators would be looking great. Um, the, the bulk of the nitrogen and other contaminant loads come in downstream of the Maungarangi Road Bridge, um, and particularly below, uh, um, around about the Pakipaki AFCO area. Um, so the concentration um, jumps up to over 0.5 around about where the AFCO um, site is, and then 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. And I think it's important to note that, um, you know, the, the scale of the reduction required to get us down to probably around about 0 0.4 would be a good um, estuarine ecosystem health level in terms of nitrogen. Um, we, we need to consider that at the moment, it's still increasing at 2.5% per year, roughly. 
and it's doubled since 1975. And there is a little bit of a lag time uh, in the in the uh, transport of nitrogen from land use to surface water bodies. And that, that can sometimes be quite a long time depending on the, the groundwater hydrology. So um, as, as was referred to before, you know, the, the date that we choose is important because um, you know, it may take another 20 years for um, today's land use nitrogen losses to reach the hour and then come through to the estuary. Um, and then it will take another 20 years for changes that we determine are necessary in 2024, 25, uh, for them to, to sort of the benefits of that mahi to be seen. Um, other, other contaminants such as phosphorus and sediment, the results are much more immediate because it's related to runoff rather than the transmission through groundwater. And, and probably this is not news to any of you, but um, just thought I'd put that into context that even though, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about water quality issues in Lake Rotorua, um, those are issues because of the lake's particular sensitivity. And if we had that water quality down in the lower river, um, we'd actually be quite quite well off. So I don't know if that's helpful or not, but um, yeah, a little bit of context. Uh, thank you. Once you, Madam Chair, um, just yeah, I uh, hope that you can come and present some of these figures and stuff to the FK hearings we've been um, going through. Um, just in terms of that, um, uh, with what FCO, the data and stuff they kind of produce uh, in these pre hearings, um, it make, they're really, really confident that it's all fine, well, and good. Uh, you know, it's awesome data on their paper, but those of us who are actually in the river, both swimming and using uh, for other purposes, um, we can, you can tell the, the difference before and after the uh, FCO site. Um, so for a lot of Tangata Whenua um, who use, use our, our resource here, um, just the data doesn't match up with what we feel, smell, taste within our work. Cool. Sure. Uh, kia ora, what, what I'll do is I'll send you and any other interested members a copy of the technical review of the AFCO consent carried out by scientist Stephen Park at Council. And he came to a similar conclusion that the, you know, the, the position of the applicant that the discharge was going to have no more than minor effects um, was, was not correct when considering the context of the receiving environment's sensitivity in terms of the estuary. So that he is advocating for more um, treatment controls to be added to the conditions of consent. So is, is that just for, just for Mokawera or would all members like to receive a copy of that technical review? Jane is putting her hand up. Grant, uh, Councillor Daly. Maybe we'll add it to the minutes, shall we, Jenny? Put my sound on and a seconder, please. Thank you, Grant. Put that seconders. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those against, no. Carried. Thank you. On to our last report, needing, a, uh, needing our uh, moving and seconding. That's the local government elections update. Are you coming? Thank yep. You. Thank you, Madam Chair. This one will take 30 seconds. So just alerting you all to the fact that um, some of our members are putting their necks on the chopping block once again um, and seeking re-election. <laughs> um, <laughs> we uh, no no I, I should I shouldn't joke. The um, the the elections in October. Uh, just the song came to mind then. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the local government elections are coming up in October, so there probably won't be another meeting of Timaru or Kaituna until early twenty three because it will take some time for 
newly elected members to go through the induction process and then those uh, agencies to go through the process of uh, nominating a representative and an alternate for Tamaru Kaituna River Authority. So from the staff, good luck to all of you if you're standing again and um, we'll see you on the other side of the new year. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Pam. No, no statements, questions? Of course not. We all know the drill, don't we? Uh, can I, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Just, uh, sorry, I just remembered. Uh, just an acknowledgement. Um, and this is to um, Moana Boyd, who passed away in May, I think, May, um, from cancer. She was battling cancer. But um, Moana was um, part of uh, putting together the plan change pie for Tamaru Kaituna. So I just wanted to acknowledge that and have that in our minute. Thank you, Dean. And, uh, yeah, I <laughs> uh, wish everyone who's standing again all the best. And the elections coming. Cheers. Thank you. Can I have a mover for that report? Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Seconder. Thank you, Grant. All those in favour, say aye. Saying aye. Carrie. Thank you. Those are reports. Um, I see we're just hitting the twelve o'clock mark, and we were about to lose our quorum. Is that correct? At midday, or have we, did we sort it? Erin's got to go. Erin, you've got to go now. Thank you, Erin, um, for your participation and keeping our quorum alive till 12. What we can do around the table, um, we can continue our discussions, but it will now be in a work form, a workshop form that we continue, and we continue for the last two presentations. For those of us say, and I'm mindful that Commissioner Wasley is has to be gone by 12.30. 12, 12 o'clock. Oh, 12.30. All right, so I'm going to pass to Nick. Nick, just two more presentations. I can uh, speed date this one. <laughs> Action 40. Action 40. I can get us started anyway. Oh, did you? I oh, know. Um, I just got asked to do the uh, the action plan fourteen. Um, so I guess um, action plan fourteen um, started around um, initially Sammy Sutton and set up of a zipline on the Kaituna or Kiriawa, and as part of that, he had a Wildlands consultant report done, and it basically showed. If you could switch to the next one, sorry. My computer's being weird. Um, basically, it showed that um, the, that um, there was it was one of the most complete, largest, open and bright, gorgeous systems in the Bay of Plenty. Good coverage of Rio Rio um, and had good secondary uh, Rio Rio, um, and there was some really important species there that were of, of high importance, particularly the um, uh, the native the um, the bat and a few other indigenous species there. So it was a really highly important area, not, not to mention obviously with um, um, and with the um, uh, local Manu Whenua, sort of the, the, the stories that were there, she could click through, have a choice. Um, so basically the, um, so based, oh, and that, by the way, is Eddie Mutu on that photo. <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's a really close uh, whānau friend, so he came down at 78, was uh, scared of heights, and um, we only heard him coming because he was singing Waiata the whole way because he was really nervous, and that's how we got through. But anyway, so... Uh, Rotorua rafting, Sammy Sutton set up with the idea because it was a, if it was really honest, it came from a commercial bend to start with, with the idea that about 100 days a year he, he wasn't um, rafting because of floods on the river and things. And so the idea for a zipline came about. And then he kind of had a 180 degree turn. Um, he's he's Tuhaurangi ancestry. And he realised that the Kaituna had given so much to many of us who'd worked on the river um, uh, and something that we absolutely believed in sort of has given out as, 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 as identity as to who we are. So he really shaped that thinking and started talking with um, Manu Whenua, Ngāti Hini Rangi, Ngāti Hini Kiri, and particularly people like um, Picky Thomas around how we could, how this partnership could come together. Um, so basically that partnership was formed as Orkiri Adventures, 
um, and again was a partnership with Manu Whenua. Um, and the landowners, Taheki, the farmland there was a big part of that. Um, from then, I sort of got involved because I started hearing the corridor that was going on and was really excited by it. And I knew it was too much to ask for a commercial entity to do all this environmental work that was potentially there. So we developed the idea and, and set up the trust, Te, Te Mauri o Kere Awa Charitable Trust, and that name was gifted by um, Piki Thomas. And it had some key key things around that. And then sitting on this on this um, awesome uh, group, Te Maru, I realised there was some it, it created a whole river approach just rather than being in this isolation at the top of the river. So um, Te Mauri o Kere Awa had some key um, purposes, and it was around that restoring the Mauri to the river by rectifying the, the effects of deforestation and um, increasing the land areas, farmland that was marginal in some cases on the river right back into the forest. I think there's about three hectares of um, reserve land there, and the long-term aims to make that to about 12 hectares. Um, another big one was a community engagement. So um, again, we were very keen to get local kura and, and, and various communities being involved in the project. Uh, I've always worked in the youth uh, social service space, so rangatahi youth involvement was really important and getting uh, a space to learn about the environment and things you can do to mitigate climate change and all those sort of things. Um, so uh, I've also working through with um, whānau that have been in some um, places and need a bit of support getting a sort of uh, at-risk youth out on there doing some planting and working around those things. Um, and again, maintaining uh, the idea that by putting a commercial entity like the zipline actually bettered the environment. And I 100% back that, that, that the environment around the Orkiri area is becoming better because of this, this product being there. So, yeah. Uh, so we've had successful, oh, I'm the chair of the trust, by the way, and we've got about five or six people on that of that, 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 that board. So the successful funding through Rotorua Energy Charitable Trust, Bay Trust and Project Crimson, to date, with um, the initial, um, the, probably the first, very first stage was culling about 160 goats that were there, and they were smashing the area on the river right. So they've been taken out, clearing of, there was um, about six hectares of just blackberry and gorse that was taken out of there. That I've updated that actually instead of 750 metres of new fence, there's actually about, I think probably there's been another easy four or 500 metres as um, the iwi farm uh, manager has put in another um, set of fences to, to sort of support the project. We've got about 60 pest traps um, and oh, the numbers have gone up way since then. So um, we're always trialling new sorts of baits and things. So we've had a big increase just recently. Uh, at the moment, I'd say there's probably closer to 14,000 native trees in the ground. Um, and these are planted by um, Sammy Sutton's dad was an old forester and he, he's a crazy old guy and he just plants all day long. And uh, then we've had local groups coming in there and planting as well. So, and then every customer, every client that comes down the, uh, down the zip line has a kawa kawa tea and then goes and plants a tree. Um, and we had Te Aariki, uh, 92 years old, fly down the first zip line. That was pretty amazing. Um, and he's a neighbour of mine, so it was beautiful to see him there. Um, planting and pest eradication keeps keeps on going. Um, and they, um, like I kept on getting asked um, how far through the project we are, and I'd say, and I don't think it'll ever end. That I don't think it'll ever be 100% because that's the whole point of it, is that it's just going to be an ongoing project. Um, yeah, and oh, we've also been able to create um, through the we don't want just the the trust to be just for that reserve in that place we want it to be for the whole whole Orkiri area so we've been able to supply a few pest traps for some other local community groups that are in the area um, that's just an example on the left actually that was probably second phase um, probably six months prior to that would have been all covered in gorse and then on the right, you can see the new fence line that we've got in there, and that's kept the goats and the and the other cattle and things out of there. At the mo and then the, we've got the planting in there, so there, there's plants every sort of meter, meter and a half apart, apart, and that's the bottom zip line there. Um, I guess there's, as I said, the aim is to have about sixty thousand plants in the next five years, um, and iwi have just been outrageously good. And they've literally retired eight hectares of land and they've been so impressed with what's going on. They've already said um, we'll retire another eight hectares. Um, so, yeah. We've taken, obviously, stoats, possums, rats. Um, stoats, uh, we've been quite hard to get and we've been catching a few of those. And I know they've just had a big, um, I think, Bay of Plenty Regional Council have supported with some poisoning as well that's been going on in that area. So it's been good.
Um, yes, yeah, so immediate future, planting of 10,000 plants a year, ongoing fencing, um, engaging with us. We really want to create a space to, um, to have a, a fuddy where kids can come out and have some sort of hands-on learning about rongoa and planting and those sort of things. And uh, part of Wildland's report was a 10-year was a plan, and we're just carrying on with the first two years of that plan. Bird counts, photo recording, Long term, um, again, um, follow the 10-year plan. Um, we'd like to irrigation and um, equipment so that we could put a potential little nursery on the on the farm as well um, with, the, uh, with the idea of locals being able to support that and then being able to actually support our own planting. Um, educational play. Um, really interesting. So down, down river from where we are was um, when Ihinga come, came up the Okiri uh, Kaituna one of the reasons to come up was his wife was hapu and was looking for want a kiwi to she was she was craving and those apparently they were doing some wallaby um looking um and they they caught a few couple of those kiwi birds on camera and further down so there's a bit of a move long term to create like an eight hectare predator proof fence and start bringing some of those birds up so that's a very long term term aim of the forest um and again new generation the idea of turning three hectares of forest into about 12 so that's kind of yeah, I think it's kind of where we're at. Um, yeah. Comment, questions, statements. Yeah, thoroughly impressed. Yeah. And I just can't, I, we couldn't have done it without Manu Whenua's support and how actively they've just said, here's some land, go for it, you know. And it's been, it's been monitored by Bay of Plenty, um, by um, DOC and Bay of Plenty Regional Council and um, the Reserve Board that's there. So it's it's got a really good overlaying of a bunch of people looking at the projects. Mm. I think um, maybe two years ago, when young Sam came in and spoke to this committee, he's such a, he's such a bundle of uh, life. And uh, I think uh, he's expressed that through all of this with the trust now, you guys just carry it really well. But I think his values were really spot on right in the beginning, you know, and that relationship with the local iwi. I think that was key was initially, yes, it was a commitment. At first, hey, I can't can't run my company because we're the river shut all the time. So I think it did start there, but he had this complete turnaround and went, this, this, this piece of water has filled us all, you know, and, and helped us all create our lives that we've had. So it, it turned around from that into a space of what can we do to make this space better? It was a genuine desire. Mm. Thank you, Nick. Well, um, yeah. Sorry. Uh, I, I think when we had the, uh, who's the guy, the navigation guy in council, the, what do you call him, the coastal guard or something? Harbour master. Harbour master. When he shut the river down and those guys couldn't come down the river, um, I think that was a turning point too that participated in that kind of rethink. Yeah, because that, that we... I think that was up in um, Okiri. Yeah. It was a very emotional hui because we had the parents of the person who died and had all the iwi hapu were all there and uh, the maru was there. And so I think we all kind of made that commitment to do something better in regards to the safety of uh, the river. Thanks. Nick, um, just great to see you. I mean, you know, uh, we were here, as as um, as Dean says, when it was introduced to us, and it's come to fruition. And you're showing us what's happening out there. It's just, you know, and the journey you've taken um, is excellent. So, thank you. Let's see more of those because these are the real success stories that kind of, you know, uh, makes the journey worthwhile. So, thank you very much, Kia ora. Sorry, just one more. Um, I think one of the things that we, we I would like to look further into is that that PO and that signage and those things that are at the entry to the Kaitun. I think that could be further developed as well, getting that story that more people come and identify that space with what it is. So yeah, I think that's that's something development down the line too. Okay, we are definitely on the home straight and we're in your hands, Dean. Your presentation is down. 
Was it yours? Sorry, I thought there was Dean's. Oh, I apologise. Uh, oh, sorry, I looked at the stunned look at, at Dean's eyes. Sorry, I made. <laughs> I'll hand it over to you, Dean. <laughs> my uh, mistake. Aroha mai. Kia koe, uh, Pim. Oh, kia ora, everybody. And I, I'll keep it relatively short because I know that, um, yeah, we've been going for a long time. Um, so I'll just share the presentation. This is uh, yeah, um, 8.4, the presentation um, on results uh, from monitoring uh, in and around the Te Awa o Ngātoro Irangi Makitu Estuary and Lower Kaitana River associated with the rediversion. So just reminding um, everyone of what the project is all about. Uh, it was first called for in 1979 by Te Arua, who said, hey, we want our river back. And they got uh, about... 4% back in 1996 with the four little culverts under Ford Road. Um, that was the first version of the project done by the Crown. And then this second version um, has has been, I guess it's been since about 2012 in, in the making. Um, so the objectives were to return at least 20% of the flow to the estuary uh, to create at least 20 hectares of new uh, wetlands, coastal wetlands maximise the ecological and cultural benefits and also to restore Papahi Kahawai, which as a result of the project would lose its access um, for cows to reach the island. That was the previous land use. Um, so pictures tell a thousand words. This is what it looked like in 2014. You can see the land formerly farmed by Alan Brain um, down in the foreground uh, here. Um, somewhat compromised by salinity and, and its low-lying nature. You can also see in the um, Papahi Kahawai Creek area this um, macroalgae and cyanobacteria infestation that was pretty much there all the time um, because of the causeways that blocked tidal flows here and here, if you can see where my mouse is. So for a long time, that 15 hectare upper portion of the northwestern part of the estuary was almost completely blocked from tidal flows and so it became hypertrophic. Um, the next image will show you what it looks like today. So you can see that um, you know there's a whole lot of salt marsh and um, revegetation occurred on that on that lowest lying land um, that was acquired from Mr. Brain. Um, you'll also see that the causeway here is gone and the causeway here uh, has gone. Um, so that reinstated tidal flushing. And so that whole Papahi Kahawai Creek is now in quite good ecological health. There's a footbridge down here so that the owners of Papahi Kahawai can still access. And you can see um, all of the restoration work that's happened on the Motu. That's about another 15 hectares. There's only a little bit of, uh, of grass uh, left there now. Um, and then coming down here, you can see the salinity block that was constructed. So there's a facility there for the Coast Guard and for the commercial fishermen. So they use that now rather than um, where they used to be in front of Tukotahi or Uncle Boy's um, marae. Just thought I'd mention one of the key monitoring um, things to take into account is the fact that for most of the last three years, we've had uh, very, very low river flows, historically um, low. Although if I produced this graph, um, at the beginning of June. Now, if I was to reproduce it now, there'd be an uptick at the end because <laughs> we've had nearly 50% of the annual rainfall in, since the 30th of May in parts of the catchment. But yeah, just, just showing you that you can see the, the, the redivision was commissioned in February 2020. And since that time, flows have been um, low. And, and in some cases, like down here, you can see creating a new historical low since the record was begun in 1986 at uh, Te Matai. Uh, one of the achievements in the last little while has been the finalisation of the archaeological report. So uh, some of you will know Ken Phillips and Cam McCaffrey. They did the investigation back in 2018-19, and it's taken a wee while for the um, radiocarbon dating, etc., to come back and get finalised. But they've shown that um, the the majority of the uh, 
artifacts uncovered at Wotaipatia uh, from around 1550 to 1650. Um, so that was the, the period when that excavated area was obviously used the most. Um, and here's a couple of examples of what's in the report that they found. So in total, I think there were something like 400 archaeological features identified and catalogued. Um, and here you can see some you know, old hearths from, from cooking, for example. Um, on this next image, you'll see three adzes that have been um, passed into Dean's um, administration to take care of uh, under that process that's administered by the Ministry for um, uh, Heritage, Culture and Heritage. Uh, and this is one of the interesting findings. So in those deposits, they found a number of vertebrae, some of which had been um, obviously carved and maybe used as um, necklaces or other things. Now, in this case, they found that the vertebrae was most likely from a great white shark, which is the first time they've um, encountered that particular species. And it's not, not that uncommon to see them, but um, yeah, kingfish and others as well. But, um, but yeah, great white was in amongst the deposits. Moving on to ecological monitoring. So here's, um, and I heard the discussion when Joe and Gemma were talking about, you know, what sort of indicators have you got? I think it was you, Commissioner Wosley. So there, there's a whole lot of monitoring in the estuary of, of a lot of different indicators. And there's, um, there's one in particular that's of interest called the ETI or the Estuarine Trophic in Index. Um, and that's made up of lots of mud quantity, size, macroalgal cover and extent, uh, dissolved oxygen levels, um, uh, and benthic and invertebrate um, diversity and abundance. Um, but these are the locations where uh, our scientist, Stephen Park, often together with um, some of the staff from Te Runanga or Ngāti Whakaue Ki Makitu have been heading out over the last couple of years to, to monitor either shellfish or macroalgae or um, oxygen levels. And that sort of augments the work of Elaine Tapsell from the Makitu Taiapuri Committee who has been collecting data on water temperature, salinity um, and a couple of other attributes for quite a long time. So what, what's uh, been found? So um, that upper part of the estuary that I showed you in the aerial photograph has seen uh, shellfish recolonize that area. Um, up to 2017, there was essentially nothing in those plots, but they're now um, you know, three to eight different species turning up in the one meter quadrats and the dissolved oxygen level is quite good. Um, we're also seeing uh, erosion of some of the anoxic muds um, from the plates up in that upper estuary. So <clears throat> something like 90 millimetres of anoxic mud disappeared off, off those plates and the substrate is becoming more sandy and, and oxygenated, which is good. Uh, here are the pippy, pippy transects in the lower estuary. And um, there's been um, some erosion of what we call the flood tide delta. So that's this big pile of sand that's come into the estuary outside the Marae since 1956 as a result of the river being taken away. Um, <clears throat> that's just starting to erode at the northern edge, which is a good thing. And so if, if you're a piece of sand in here, uh, up until 2020, your pathway would have generally been to the left, from right to left, sort of filling in the estuary. But since 2020, um, the, the pathway of a piece of sand in there is generally out. And uh, so the locals have been telling me they've seen a lot of sand um, flushed out um, the entrance to the estuary, and that will presumably end up on the um, on the on the side of Okude Point, and will potentially around on New Dix Beach. Uh, over time, there's probably about a one and a half, two million cubic meters of sand that's piled up in the estuary since 1956. Um, pippy densities are about the same, but um, Stephen's saying that he's seeing more recruitment of juveniles and in, um, into the population. Um, so with a bit of luck uh, over time, and also if the harvesting pressure is is not greater than the rate of recruitment, um, that's a good sign for the future. 
this is this is quite a good news graph. This one, so um, macro algae. That's kind of uh, sea lettuce and uh, Gracilaria chilensis. Some of those undesirable seaweeds that can um, take over in an estuary if it's eutrophic because of the nutrient levels. And what you'll see is that it built up um, substantially um, to cover um, 60 hectares of the estuary um, until just before the rediversion took place. But once those uh, causeways were removed and um, the parts of the area unblocked to tidal flushing, that, that started in 2017, and then after that, when the extra river water was introduced in early 2020, that macro will cover has really declined. And um, it's, a, it's a pretty good result. Um, one of the really good things is that the, well, there's some feedback. Joe, have you got your microphone on there? Um, the the blue-green algae, which is this, this portion of the cover here, so that was occupying over 10 hectares of the estuary in 2014, and that's completely disappeared now. And the great thing about that is the blue-green algae not only grows from nitrogen in the water column, but it also fixes atmospheric nitrogen and adds that to the load that's in the estuary. So it's kind of like a reinforcing feedback loop, and that's it's good to see that um, gone. Nearly finished, Jenny and Madam Chair. Um, Revegetation or vegetation plots. So there were a whole lot of plots established in 2013, and those have been remeasured. And probably the one big change to note is some of the freshwater wetland near the confluence of the river and the new channel is changing from freshwater to brackish or to saline wetland because of the changed hydrodynamics. And that change has happened a little bit faster than we predicted because of the um, low river flows. So the salinity and the rediversion has been higher than predicted because the, we've been sitting at historically low uh, water levels. As a result of that, and a couple of queries from boaties, we're working on a partial gate closure matrix so that when we do have really low river flows and we have spring tides or you know, high tidal amplitudes, we'll close some of the gates so that we don't pull too much salt water around at the same time. Um, and um, I think I've shown you this before, but uh, it's great to see a few patches of seagrass starting to turn back up in the estuary and it was almost extinct um, a couple of years ago. Swan counts, some of you are interested in the number of swans and their impact. Um, so Fish and Game um, has got quite a long standing data set over the last 30 years. And that shows a general trend towards an increase, although not so in the last couple of years. There have been a number of um, collaboration opportunities with Tangata Whenua. So there's a group uh, that we work with um, in the lower estuary and, and they've helped out with a number of these uh, tasks in the last year. And the other interesting report that's been completed is um, a repeat of the social uh, use and impacts survey that was conducted first of all in 2013 um, and again in last year. And that's just looking at you know who uses the estuary and the access points around it, how often, what for, um, whether they're perceiving things to be heading in the right direction or the wrong direction. And the findings from that are generally pretty positive. Um, one of the findings was that the, the current speeds at the diving board or at the at the toka, the bottom of um, the estuary, have increased a bit. And so swimmers just have to be on their, on their guard um, because with the increased river flows, especially when, when it's um, in flood, um, it can go through there a bit faster than it did before. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Pam. Comments, questions? Madam Chair, just another congratulations, I think, uh, to Pim, you and your team and to every, all the staff and, and, and the uh, local Tangata Whenua groups, uh, community groups. Um, our total 
Good games, eh? Julian and them, so you know, it's a great effort. We, 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 when you get in uh, community groups like this, working together, and you can see the result. And uh, I think, end of the day, that was the whole reason for this entity, was to work together uh, and uh, support each other. So, well done. I'll echo the same sentiments, uh, Pim, but uh, when you started the presentation, it just... Um, brought to mind, um, I guess, in the 1980s, when I was still part of, on staff at Western Bay of Plenty District Council, where there were numerous and frequent visits to Makitu to talk to Mana Whenua, and they were very fiery, and uh, they went on for a long, long time. Uh, and to see this come to fruition, and, uh, you know, the Hokainga working alongside, um, you know, it, it did take a long time. Uh, it wasn't just about building that relationship, but the whole thing about having the re estuary return to what it was and that what Mana Whenua wanted. So, yeah, it's, it's a huge achievement and congratulations for the part that you've played in getting it there. Okay, on that note, uh, we have come to the end of our meeting. Well done. It is 12.29 and we've done very... I'm very sorry if you've got part throats and I didn't give you a break, uh, but we made it and uh, we... Yeah, we've made it. So, you know, um, the last meeting and on behalf of Dean, if you allow me, I just want to take, thank all of us um, for this last term um, and hope some of us will return. So we, we may not all return, but I hope some of us uh, <laughs> return to maintain the consistency and the path that we've been taking. But, uh, you know, for all of us who are, who are seeking re-election, um, good luck to all of us. Thank you. And without further ado, I'm going to hand to you, um, Dean, to close our meeting. Ka whiua te rākau kei mōera, kei te kapi ka mātou uhi e wā. Kia ora rā. Kia ora, Madam Chair. Uh, Itera tēnā tātou. Uh, e hoa, your opening karakia was tu tapu. I might not be able to close that tapu off. Kia ora no tēnā rā tātou. Uh, Utira Kasika uh, Tukutonunga Mihi, Yokotonga Kaikumihana, uh, O Natal Kopahuria Kene, uh, uh, Kowai Kahua, Kowai Katohu, uh, uh, Mungatawe Kemaine, uh, Kyo no Kote, Tikoingo Tengaka, uh, Kariro Katohu Katsu, uh, Unga Pono, Unga Kau Tosika, uh, Kinga kau papa kei mua i te aroaro. Uh, Matuara ia tēnei taha, tēnei take uh, ki te kaituna. Uh, hio e no, i mihi tonu ana ki au koutou. Uh, o tira uh, uh, ngā iwi, o tēnā iwi, o tēnā iwi, tēnā rā tātou katoa. Uh, ka whakakapia kei kone. <coughs> Kia whakiria ke, uh, ki te pai taráwhare, ki te pō mata o te rangi, te taku o wenei kōrero tapu o tēnei wānanga. Ah, kia tū, kia tū, kia eke, kia eke, whāno, whāno, haramai, tū mai te toki, hau ie, hui ie, tā i ki ie. Tēnā tātai.